Let's start today as a kicking off point for collaboration and community that will see us through the whole of 2023. So our day today is packed full of interesting conversations, speeches and sessions for you to immerse yourself in sharing our, our lived experiences and our knowledge so that other organisations can, can really step into this as well. Culture Shift has quite a lot of partners so yeah it's good to have I guess the different experiences of each and every one of them because they all implement it a bit different. The, the, the need to connect with other people, learn from each other is, is really important. Also gaining funding, the data that you get from report and support is so invaluable. Um, previously, I think when you were talking around um, campaigns or um, different initiatives in this area, perhaps you were clutching at straws and didn't have the data to back it up. You weren't saying, well, we clearly have a, an issue in this area or this group of individuals um, are being kind of disproportionately affected by this form of harassment. I couldn't have said that three years ago. Culture Shift being able to provide these sorts of training opportunities are, are, are really, really important to me. The session on that kind of preventative campaigning was, was really helpful actually. I think the, the ability for survivors to be able to be supportive and, and, and feel like they can trust the system and therefore trust us as an institution to, to help them in the journey that, that they're on, um, that, that's the most important thing that we get from report and support that provided by Culture Shift. There's been lots of opportunities to speak to people and, and network and just have the opportunity to listen. So I've met um, quite a few colleagues from other institutions in London, which has been nice. We will continue to push for change to help with not only a better product, but a better system of support, education and development. So thank you everyone so much for coming along. I hope there's been a lot for you to take away and a lot to engage with. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to the annual Culture Shift Knowledge Forum 2022. We're incredibly excited to have so many of you joining us, both here in person and on our live stream. Today's Knowledge Forum, for those of you that might remember, looks very different from the first event we held four years ago. Kindly hosted by UCL, we had a modest 18 people from 19 partners joining us to talk about a report and support system that was very different from the platform we have today. Now we have a community of over 90 partners and all of you are taking time out of a very busy period, so thank you, to come along together and help us realise our ambitions of creating a world that is safer, happier and more supportive for everyone everywhere. Since the first Knowledge Forum, there's been quite a lot that we have all faced. A global pandemic, a change of monarch, countless prime ministers. We've seen waves of social movements, huge policy changes at government level and right down to individual level around regulatory too. All of which this change, you know, we've seen will change our work and how we think and will each and every one will impact our way we work and our lives and in many different ways. I think it's fair to say that in the past few years, it's really proven that the only constant is change. Here at Culture Shift, we're no stranger to change. In the last 12 months, 13 new culture shifters have joined our team, nearly doubling us to over 30 employees. I hope that you've already begun to see the impact that they have begun to make on our product and our services and our support offerings. I'm one of the newish members of that team, so I'll take a little bit of an opportunity to introduce myself. Um, I've worked in higher education for the last 15 years, and I've had the pleasure of meeting many of you and working with you across my time at UCL, Queen Mary, Goldsmiths, and perhaps even as far back as NUS. Um, I joined Culture Shift just six months ago as the head of cultural transformation, tasked with helping you make a positive change within your organisations. And it's been my pleasure alongside Kenya, who you've just heard from as our marketing and product manager, um, who, to co-organise this conference today. After two years of hosting this conference online, we're obviously for everyone's safety during the pandemic times, it's been really brilliant to be back in this room and to see all of you here in this space. So thank you so much for making today happen. You may have already had the opportunity as well to meet Naomi Davidson, our new head of customer success. She's been on the registration desk this morning. Naomi will continue to play a huge role in helping connect report and support to you, helping you to engage with our team, your relationship managers, who you will have seen when you came in as well, um, and get the absolute most out of your partnership with us. 
We also have many other new culture shifters in the room um, and we would really love you to meet them and say hello. So look out for them because we really want them to feel welcomed into our amazing community of culture changers. So new team members, really exciting, but they're only one part of the journey of change for us at Culture Shift. We've grown and expanded, and now we proudly work alongside the NHS, private sector organisations such as EY, and we're expanding our reach into different types of education too. We now work with many colleges across England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and during our years working with the majority of higher education sector, we've gained a huge amount of knowledge and experience addressing harassment and discrimination in this context. We intend to use this knowledge of what has worked to support other sectors along their journeys too. This knowledge will help us to support the 64% of workplace employees that say that they experience problematic behaviour at work and it negatively impacts their mental health. And it will help us, the 71% the of employees calling in sick to avoid seeing someone they had a negative relationship with at work. There's a long way to go in this new range of workplaces, some really big and new challenges. But as our speakers will demonstrate today, there's a lot of effective action and best practice that we can all learn from. Our move into the further education feels timely too, and really positive for us, we hope also for the sector. In, in research that we conducted recently, we unearthed that the issue of misconduct across further education, we found that 49% of respondents experienced some kind of inappropriate behaviour and a staggering 78% had witnessed inappropriate behaviour. Our research found that there was a culture of normalcy um, concerning harassment and misconduct in education and deeply embedded throughout. But what we recognise with the further education sector is a journey which parallels the one we've been on with higher education. One that calls for more regulation, significant adaptations in senior leaderships, prioritisation of anti-harassment strategies, and increased investment of time, resources, to tackle and prevent the issues. We hope that our work with partners in this sector helps to encourage more young people to speak up and seek the support to challenge the startling rates of both harassment and silence that our data is showing. The Ofsted Rapid Review into Sexual Misconduct stated that leaders across the sector can assume that sexual harassment, online sexual abuse are happening in their settings, even when there are no specific reports. It spoke of the action and shared responsibility on individual institutions, regulators and government to invoke much needed change. And just as the Office for Students evaluation recently into the Statement of Expectations highlighted, more progress is needed to make and address harassment and misconduct on campuses. And equally in the same way, the Equality and Human Rights Commission have recently backed further bills to tackle harassment and misconduct at work. Wherever you look, the call to increase actions are mountain. But the incredible thing about creating change, this kind of positive social change that a lot of our work revolves around is that you don't have to do it alone. It may sometimes feel really isolating, but we've seen firsthand how people and organizations can band together to share experiences and knowledge in the pursuit of putting an end to violence. Culture Shift is immensely proud and dedicated to work alongside inspiring organisations such as Emily Test, 1752 Group and Not On My Campus, to name just a few, all of whom lead positive change and were born from the determination of a few to galvanise others into action and demand better from people and institutions around them. Some of these organisations are represented in our agenda over the next two days, sharing their knowledge, insight and experience, which I'm incredibly grateful for. I hope that today we'll demonstrate how collaboration can fuel innovation and action. I encourage each of you today to share your stories, challenges, hurdles that you've had over the last year. Listen to the successes of the people around you and challenge each other's thinking on how we can do more to effectively take action on and prevent misconduct in our different settings. Maintaining the status quo is not a viable option. This is a notion that we carry with us every day with the development and enhancement of our product. The improvements and innovations developed within our platform over the last year have always been as a direct response to the challenges and requirements you've communicated to us. Updates such as the ability to reclassify incident types once you've received a report, or grouping multiple mentions, these are designed to give you greater administrative control over your cases. Our updated analytics tool, 
was improved to help you better understand the data coming through our system, better communicate it outwardly, and create action plans based on evidence in those insights. We promise to maintain our focus on developing software and services that support you in facing the challenges you encounter in your role, keeping victims and survivors at the heart of our solution and helping you to support you to the best of our ability. You can speak to our product team today, and hopefully you already have during some of the feature demos. Um, we will be repeating those again over lunch, so please do continue to engage with them. They might even share with you some of the things we've got in store over the coming year. Two such features include the enhanced benchmarking. This will allow us to provide you with more comparison data from information that's contained within your reports, and you'll be hearing more from us about that soon. And data and insights publishing, which will help you to publish data and sharing it with your key stakeholders loads easier. Over the next year, we'll also be sharing our roadmap more publicly, so you can always be on the pulse of what's in store and more easily fit into how the system will evolve with time. We will continue to push for change, to help with not only a better product, but a better system of support, education and development. So our day-to-day -day is packed full of interesting conversations, speeches and sessions for you to immerse yourself in. We'll begin the morning by welcoming three incredible guests to kick off our opening plenary, where we'll be discussing sm how small actions can be taken to break down huge systems of oppression. After that, we'll splinter off into our individual breakout groups, where you'll either hear from our partners about using report and support as a small and specialist institution, no mean feat, or taking action on anonymous reports. In this room here, two of our partner institutions, the University of York and Glasgow Caledonian, will be joining Johanna Corpi from the Not On My Campus to discuss effective campaigning and how to promote the use of report and support to your target users. After lunch, we've got an incredible keynote speech that I'm really looking forward to from Drs. Jane, Brian, Imogen Davis and Amanda Wilson from the University of Warwick who will be sharing their work on restorative justice and looking at how it can be used as a tool for reducing interpersonal harm. Then we'll move into three fantastic breakout sessions. The first will be held by Glitch, a charity whose mission is very similar to our own. They are committed to making the online space safe for all by working to end online abuse. They do this by mobilizing in education and inspiring everyone that has a role to play, from individuals, communities, and holding governments and tech platforms to account much like us. Um, with a focus on the disproportionate impact online abuse has on black women and other marginalized groups. Their session today will be talking about dealing with online abuse and showing you how you can play your part at an individual and institutional level. At the same time, Graham Tao, professor of forensic psychology at Durham University and author of multiple books on addressing gender-based violence, will be sharing his invaluable insights alongside associate professor David Humphreys and Bridget Steele, both researchers from the University of Oxford, who will be speaking about the work that they've undertaken to measure the prevalence of sexual violence, attitudes towards consent and, behavior, and bystander behaviour. For the final breakout session, we have Leaders Unlocked, an organisation that enables young people and underrepresented groups to have a stronger voice on the issues that affect their lives. In education, policing, health, justice and elsewhere, they help to organise to involve people who matter in decision making for the better. They'll be sharing their work on a number of student-led commissions that they have con helped contribute positive student-informed action across a number of further education institutions. And they'll be sharing how you can apply that in your own settings. We will then close with a panel on breaking down barriers to reporting. I'll be joined by Sunday Blake of Wonky, Danny Bradford of Students' Union UCL, and Kelly Prince of the 1752 Group, where we'll discuss the personal, practical, and political barriers to speaking up about harassment and how we have taken steps to support victim survivors along that process. After all these conversations, we'll finish with the drinks reception. I really hope that with time travel, travel times, um, <laughs> I really hope for time travel, I really hope with travel times, you'll find the opportunity to stick around for a drink or two, catch up with old colleagues, new culture shifters, and the speakers from today's events. So the year ahead of us will be full of many of the same challenges we faced this year, and there's no doubt new challenges will present themselves too. Let's start today with kicking off, as a kicking off point for collaboration and community that will see us through the whole of 2023. I hope that you enjoy today, everything today has to offer, and I look forward to speaking with more of you over the course of the day. Thanks. 
And I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Chris, who will be chairing the next session. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm assuming our speakers are coming up. Do they know they're coming up? Yeah, uh, yes, I would like to please invite up uh, Christopher Owen from Manchester Pride, um, Emma Palmer from Impact Culture, and Emma Green from the Barbican Arts Centre, please, join me on a panel uh, where we'll be discuss discussing the role of organisations in challenging uh, systematic oppression. Um, so, oh, I'm, just, I'm, so I'm Chris Norfolk, I'm the Head of Development here at Culture Shift, uh, and I might just pass the mic down to let you, you guys introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Emma Green, I'm the Head of EDI at the Barbican. Hi, I'm Emma Palmer, pronouns she, her, and I'm the Head of Inclusion and Equity at Impact Culture. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Christopher Owen, I use he and they pronouns. Um, and I'm the Inclusivity Development Manager at Manchester Pride. I think I've, I'm not going to say well. So there isn't a two mics. Maybe I'll just use this one back and forth. We need to use that one back and forth. That's okay. Um, so yeah, so um, if you'd like to just take a few moments uh, individually to kind of introduce who you are, what your kind of working lived experiences, uh, what you feel most comfortable sharing, and what does um, kind of oppression mean to you? Sure, so um, uh, Vicky and I were actually student officers together, which you'll probably be unsurprised by because that's the kind of background that um, activists come from a lot of the time. Um, I actually started my kind of journey in my career um, after leaving university up in Penrith, which isn't too far from here. Um, believe it or not, I, had a I have a degree in outdoor leadership. That's a real thing. Uh, <laughs> supposedly, I was supposed to be an outdoor instructor, so that hasn't worked very well because I now live in London. Um, <laughs> so, um, but I, I got into student politics quite quickly, actually, and um, and really a lot of the work that I've been doing has kind of come from there. Um, ended up working for the National Union of Students, working with their liberation campaigns uh, of quite a few years ago now, and then have really been doing EDI work for the last ten years, um, helping organisations to uh, change their cultures. Um, usually trying to uh, help them to work around organisational development and change rather than kind of system, uh, programmatic work. Um, so I spend most of my time writing strategies and persuading people to follow those strategies in a practical way. So hopefully I'll be able to say some useful things today. Um, I suppose in terms of my lived experience, I mean, living in the middle of Cumbria quite a few years ago now, um, you can imagine I was almost quite literally the only gay in the village. Um, it was an interesting experience. Um, so, you know, I have, I have certainly had some uh, quite particular experiences of living in smaller places and, and experiencing the kind of isolation that can come with that. Um, equally, you know, as someone who's more masculine presenting, it can be an interesting time to use particularly service station toilets. Um, always a fun one. Um, so, you know, there, there, are, there are a multitude of different ways that oppression can present itself, I think, um, uh, sometimes uh, in the places you least expect it. Um, but for me, oppression is really about um, kind of this use of uh, power over other people to try to do something negative or try to change them or reduce them or even destroy them in some way, shape or form. So oppression can come in many forms and I think is, is um, uh, on a scale, certainly, whether it's about toilets or anything else. Uh, and that's, that's probably my bit. Is that okay? Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, my name's Emma. Um, I started my career, um, well, I was an actor for about a year, um, uh, at the age of 20, 21. Um, and then I became a police officer for eight years, um, met police, uh, working in Brixton. And I think, you know, my journey, uh, my, my, my career, I guess, has kind of come full circle because the reason why I joined an institution like the police was I naively thought that I could change it from the inside out. And I was very young um, and I have always had a justice or a social justice lens. Um, and I think that going into an institution like that was a, a bit of a culture shock um, because I was very conflicted. Um, I grew up in a time when uh, 
I saw um, a, a guy called Stephen Lawrence, um, who was a black guy, um, and he was murdered by five white guys in a place called Eltham in London. And that stuck with me uh, throughout my, um, my younger years, I think, in terms of the racism and um, the effects that racism had on me growing up. And I always... I don't know, it just followed me. And so joining an institution like the police, for me, felt quite conflicted at the time because of the, the police's role in, in, in how they dealt with um, Stephen's murder. And I went into that institution and I had a great first three years. Um, I think I was good at my job and, and, and I did the best I could. And then the London riots happened and I was involved in that and that took its toll on my mental health. So I spent four years trying to figure out what I wanted to do and then finally left in 2015. And, and I've spent the last sort of seven, eight years in, in the EDI space. Um, I joined Stonewall for two and a half years, working with several organisations on their um, LGBT inclusion journeys, um, which then kick-started my career, I guess, in the EDI space. So now I do a lot of work um, on anti-racism um, and LGBT inclusion, inclusion and talking about intersectionality. Um, and I've worked with the NHS. Um, I've also worked in the third sector. Um, and I've also worked uh, in organizations, um, more commercial organizations like Sainsbury's as well. So yeah, uh, I've had quite a varied career, um, I'd say. And similar to yourself, it's just trying to influence. It's trying to engage organizations in strategy um, and also lived experiences and trying to bridge the two. Um, in terms of my own personal lived experience, um, I identify as a gay woman, mixed race black, um, born and raised in London, spent five years in Swindon um, from the age of 11 to 16, which was really interesting. Um, and yeah, I think my experiences of racism growing up has really shaped who I am today and the approach that I take with organizations in um, challenging some of the um, systemic oppression that we know exists. Um, and for me, oppression, similar to yourself, Emma, it's about power, it's about uh, the combination of prejudice and power and how that's used to discriminate um, and how that's used to benefit others as well. When people say, you know, the justice system it, uh, doesn't work, it's working very well. Um, it's, it's working in the way that it, it's intended to work for those that benefit from it. Um, so I think over the years, my approach to EDI has changed because fundamentally we need to think differently about this work. Everything we've done before hasn't worked. Um, so I think we need to go in slightly um, in a more robust way, I think. 100% agree with all of that. That was fantastic. Thank you. Um, so like I said, my name is Christopher. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. I'm loving all the queer representation up here. Like, like look at this power that's brilliant and beautiful. Um, so um, a little bit about my background, I guess. So I grew up in a very right wing, very hick, very Christian, very hockey obsessed Canadian town, a um, little farming village. Um, uh, so that was a nightmare. Um, and then I ran away to university um, and um, went through and got a, eventually got um, a PhD in intersectional systemic oppression, primarily through the lens of black and queer feminisms. Um, and so I have a very like academic background in that. Um, became a little bit disillusioned with academia and its lack of ability to actually uh, do anything about oppression. They like to talk about it, but don't do a lot about it. And so I left to work um, in um, sort of more on the ground activism with my community. So I started by working with queer youth um, in Salford and in Manchester, uh, creating programs um, and creating training opportunities for their teachers and for other professionals who work with youth. Um, and that just led to the sort of a recognition of needing more resources. Um, so I ended up publishing a book called Visible Justice, which is an LGBTQ plus inclusivity handbook for professionals um, that's sold by 42nd Street and 100% of proceeds go to queer youth in Greater Manchester, if you're interested. Um, but um, really uh, that then led to my work at Manchester Pride. So I um, deliver uh, consultations to organizations through a program called the All Equals Charter. That's allequalscharter.com. Um, and through that program, I sort of assess organizations for their inclusivity practices and then provide bespoke guidance on how to improve those practices. Um, and one of the things that we found, as you were saying, Emma, is that our traditional approaches to EDI don't 
work. They, they just simply don't work. And there's tons of research in this area. And so we're looking at sort of innovative new approaches that do work. And the way to do that is to stop thinking about it as like tackling discrimination, but actually think about it as tackling oppression. And, and that work isn't about inclusion, it's about liberation. And how do we do that as organizations? Um, so um, for me, systemic oppression is, yes, absolutely about power and absolutely about domination and harm. But it's also about access to opportunity, just to add like a different way of thinking about it. And that opportunity might be getting a job, the opportunity to get hired. Um, it might be the opportunity to get promoted. We talk about the glass ceiling all the time, right? Um, it might be the opportunity for people to respect your pronouns. Um, it might be the opportunity to walk home safely. It might be the opportunity that, that when you call the police, they don't kill you, right? So it can, it can really vary, but, but those access to opportunities. And that can come from institutions, it comes from bureaucracy, it comes from a cultural unconscious and the cultural belief systems. Um, so it's really quite wide ranging and, and works within a matrix of a variety of different frameworks. Thank you. Um, so I've got some prepared questions and I think we're going to take some questions from the audience afterwards. Um, so I'll start by asking the first question. Um, so sometimes working in, in EDI for kind of systemic change, it feels a little bit like, you know, the old saying of how do you eat an elephant? It's like one bite at a time. I feel like all those small actions um, feel like very small against the whole of the of the change we're trying to work. So from your experience, you know, what, what is the impact of these small actions upon the wider um, on wider cultural change, both within and also beyond organizations, individual organizations. And what advice would you give to the people who are obviously here today who are responsible for trying to strategic strategically address oppression um, in the organizations? And maybe I'll switch the order up and start at the other end. <laughs> is this, is, oh, it's working, thank, thank goodness. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this question. I think um, it's really important that we unpack questions like this because there's a real risk of putting the responsibility of change on individuals. And I don't think that that works. And I don't think it's healthy or safe or productive. And I think we do need to be thinking about collective action. So um, what, an example um, uh, to answer your question is at Manchester Pride, we created something called the Thriving Rider. So in festival organizing and in arts organizing, we all have something called an accessibility writer. So when we work with an artist, they'll fill out a little form explaining our, their accessibility needs to us in very specific terms. So we expanded that for our staff on what will help you thrive. So yes, that includes accessibility needs, but it also includes things that just like make you feel good and make you happy or like, you know, like, um, any disability requirements, and uh, but also like religious requirements or requirements as a trans person, and so on and so forth. So a really quite qu quite broad scope. But then from there, after filling that out, we then create a strategy, right? So those little actions that you might do every day are contributing to a larger strategy, a larger um, sort of focus, if that makes sense. So I think it's about knowing what the big picture is and then working towards that. You know, you use the metaphor of like, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Uh, eventually that meat will go bad, right? Actually, we all need to have a bite of the elephant. We all need to be eating it together. So we need to be working together. And so whatever your actions are, they should be collaborative. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'd agree with all of all of that. I think that there's this misconception that you have to immediately change things and and get to the end of this. There is no end. This is this is constant. This is uh, this is work. Um, and the work I do, the work you do, the work you do, the work everybody does will contribute to, to change and progress at some point. Don't know when that'll be, um, but it's those small incremental things that you're doing daily that amount to the bigger the bigger wins. Um, so anybody that's feeling overwhelmed or fatigued, um, those are real feelings because this work is hard, but it's those small things that amount to those big wins. And so I would encourage people when they're looking at strategy or they're looking at what they can do within their organizations to tackle some of this stuff, start off really small. Because that's 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 where you know, that's where the real change happens. Um, and as you said, this is a collective. Um, this isn't about doing something for one year or running a program or running an initiative. 
this is embedding it throughout the entire fabric of an organization. So everybody does have to be on board with this. Um, and, and it's difficult to do, it's not easy. But I think um, we need to start doing things differently. Um, another barrier, I think, is language. Um, the word oppression can be quite... Um, can be quite difficult and uncomfortable for people, particularly within organisations. It's not really a term that's used. It's rooted in social justice. Um, it's rooted in uh, black liberation. And so for an organisation to hear that they're oppressive or that they have policies and systems that are oppressive, there's, there's your barrier already um, to, to engaging people. Um, but we have to keep going. We have to keep chipping away at it because we are living in a system where people are oppressed and those oppressions live in um, all the sectors that, that we know of and that we exist in um, and so I think we need to just start being bolder with our language really um, and, and sharing our, our lived experiences and our knowledge so that other organisations can, can really step into this as well. Thanks. Obviously, agree with everything. Of course, I'm just going to keep saying this. Um, but I think I think the, the the ask of what can we do on a daily basis that's small really depends on what small is to you, I suppose. <laughs> and here we go. <laughs> we all good? Okay. Um, yeah, it really depends on what small is for you. So if you're a CEO, small for you is massive for somebody else. So don't presume that uh, that you should be doing the same thing as another person who perhaps might be more junior and less influential. So it's really about knowing what you can do in your day-to-day -day life and really having a reflection on that and making sure you're using the influence that you do have if you have it. Um, so there's a bit of that, I think. Um, I think in terms of contributing to uh, cultural change, a really important thing is to try and make things pull in the similar direction. It's really good that we all try to do something in our daily lives to end oppression. But actually, if we can try to pull that energy in a similar direction, it starts to create change when it's collective. So that's where I think having an idea of where we get people together to talk about the kinds of things we want to solve together. So that's why diversity networks are super important, trade unions are super important. This idea of collectivism and working together to create change is really key when we decide which direction we're gonna head in to try and solve a problem. Um, so it's as much about what direction are we heading in as what do we do, I think. Um, and in terms of particular examples, I mean, clearly, you can just be, you know, decent human beings to each other. You'd hope that that would be a normal, everyday thing that people would do. Um, but again, it depends on the context of your work. If you are able to, what you should be doing is making sure that the work that you do in your daily life, whatever that is, is designed in a way which is um, around anti-oppression or is around inclusion, depending on, you know, the approach that you're taking. So rather than saying, what can I do on top of my daily work? It's how does my daily work, uh, how can I change what I do in my daily work to make it a part of this? Um, and that will look different for different people, but that's a good point to be in your team saying, what can we do? What is our daily work and how does that contribute to, or how should or could it contribute to making a fairer world? Um, what is our unique role in that? And therefore, what is my role in the daily work that I do? Thank you. I think, yeah, there's some really important things in there. So I think, you know, for example, a culture shift, we consider the, the development team might be considering the accessibility of the products we build as part of like, that's how they can contribute towards, you know, our mission of, of inclusion. Obviously our HR team, uh, they're looking at it from a very different angle, like from a policy angle or something. Yeah, it's absolutely important. Um, and also recognizing, you know, very important point you made about recognizing the different sizes of contributions people can make. So we have a celebrate channel on our on our Slack, which people can, you know, thank someone for doing something. And you know, Vicky will get many celebrations of putting this on. But also, um, someone might get a celebration like, oh, this person helped me out today, and it's, you know, just on like unlocking, you know, with an IT issue or something like that. And it's really important to recognize that all those different scales and, and getting that that culture in there. Can I just add another thing to that? Something I think that is quite simple to do. Um, a lot of this starts with the self. A lot of this starts with yourself and how you know your identity and your lens and your experiences shape how you move in the world. Um, and often people will say, well, where do I start? Where do I find this? Where do I find that? Google is your friend, but there's millions of things on Google and I don't think that's helpful either. Find your thing, find your glossary, and then 
go to those glossaries and stay with them. So if I want to find out anything on LGBT, I will always use Stonewall. If I want to find anything out on um, uh, anti-racism or how to be anti-racist in, in a particular organisation, I may use particular um, glossaries that refer to that as well, BLM or whatever it might be. I will always find my thing and, and stick to that. And I think that's quite a useful thing to do. Find your thing and stick to it. Otherwise, you'll just be overwhelmed with so many different resources, glossaries, podcasts, um, books. There's so much out there. I just think narrow it down a bit and find out what it is you can um, access and what, what, how you, you sort of take information in. Um, because I will always go to the same things. And obviously, if I find something different, great. But I think start there and then work your way through. That's brilliant. And I think also really nicely segues into the second question, which is, you know, what are those day-to-day -day actions that people can take to address oppression or oppressive practices in organisations? And I think you've, I don't know if you want to add anything more, want to start there, Emma? I guess maybe just set yourself mini goals, um, like introduce two or three articles a week that you might read. Um, open your so sort of social media up to followers that you might not necessarily follow um, ordinarily, um, and then just start there. Um, we all, myself included, you know, we have our echo chambers and we go down our own little rabbit holes, but if we can find things that are slightly different from us or engage in things that we wouldn't necessarily engage in, then set yourself those mini goals each week. What articles am I going to read about trans issues um, or, you know, um, anti-racism or disability and go to those things and make sure you expand your your mind and, and, and the information that you take in weekly and then slowly increase it. Maybe start reading that book that you've wanted to read but haven't. Um, it, you know, it starts there really, it starts with yourself. Um, but those would be the things that I would do. Just try and set yourself um, mini, mini goals each week. Uh, do you want to add anything, Emma? Yes. Hi. Um, I think, yeah, so I think it's always personal, a lot of this stuff, isn't it? Because that's, that's what you can affect on a day-to-day -day basis. I think for me, again, it's, it's on the learning point. I think um, if you haven't heard of it already, there's this really interesting psychological uh, concept called um, uh, cognitive dissonance. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, do Google it, look it up. Um, it's a really important thing to be aware of for yourself and to remind yourself of on a daily basis. So if any of you have mindfulness practice, for example, and you do that on a daily basis, I'd also encourage you to have cognitive dissonance awareness on a daily basis, because the more you can be aware of what we mean by cognitive dissonance and when it happens to you, which is basically this idea that you believe something to be true about yourself or about the world, and then you're confronted with information that contradicts that, you try to minimize it or ignore it. And this happens about anything. It could be about smoking, it could be about driving while texting, it could be lots of things, but I think it's about what many of us don't realize, which is that we like to think of ourselves as people who would never possibly discriminate or oppress. And so it's actually harder to recognize when we're minimizing information that might be the opposite of that. So the more you can practice on a daily basis, recognizing that feeling of cognitive dissonance or when your brain jumps to try and minimize information, the more you can be mindful of that, the more you can start to quite critically and objectively, without shaming yourself, but critically and objectively recognise when you might not be being as unbiased as you think you are. Um, and I think, to me, that's a really good start. Yeah, I'm going to do oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. This is going to be a lot of juggling. Um, I really love both of those points. Thank you. I, in s to avoid repeating w what you've said, I think what I'd like to share is sort of maybe what you do next. So you've done the internal reflection, you've done a lot of reading, now what? So I want to encourage everyone in this room to read a book. It's very thin, it's very accessible. It's called What White People Can Do Next. It's by Emma Dabiri, brilliant um, historian in social justice um, and especially black activism. Um, uh, she wrote What White People Can Do Next in response to um, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement in 2020 and a lot of white people reading books about racism and then doing nothing. Um, and so it is like, yeah, let's do the reflective bit. Let's do the reading. We need to educate ourselves. We need to update our understanding. Absolutely, there's a huge knowledge gap that we need to address. 
but then what, all right? So the number one thing that um, Emma DeBeer recommends is coalition building. Um, coalition building is where you team up with other organizations that have different skills or resources than you have in order to work towards a collective movement or a collective goal. So for example, maybe your organization um, has a lot of money and can donate money or donate spaces or donate um, time, great. Uh, or maybe it's got specific skill sets in marketing. Right? And then you're working with another organization that's got specific skill sets in law. Right? And then you're working together to change a law around access to housing. Right? Um, and you're working with a housing organization. And you're working with people experiencing homelessness. And you're working with trans people, 25% of which have experienced homelessness. Right? So that's lots of different organizations with lots of different experiences, all working towards the same goal access to housing, which benefits all of us, right? Most of the people in this room probably secretly are only one or two paychecks away from really struggling, right? And like that's something to really recognize. Um, a second thing that you can do, um, I'm gonna be drawing off of the work now of uh, Professor uh, Patricia Hill Collins. She's a black feminist scholar um, in America. She's really prolific in intersectionality theory. But she recommends sort of key areas of, of resistance work. So the first one is um, sort of organizational and institutional. That's the coalition building side. Um, an alternative option is full revolution if you're into it. Um, second option is bureaucracy. So the ways that policies and procedures actually are, are structured to control populations, but actually you can use them to your advantage. You can flip that script um, and hold your organization accountable by holding it to its own values. Most organizations have a vision or a mission or some sort of values, right? So when your organization isn't holding, like, isn't helping with social justice or isn't helping against oppression. You can say, but our values are this. It's our values are making the world a better place or contributing to X or Y. Why aren't we doing that in this way? And, and sort of just pushing back and, and finding your empowerment in that way. The third area is um, about cultural belief systems. So number one is not believing fake news, not believing myths, not believing all the lies and stereotypes that we're told about marginalized people. It's about educating yourself 100%. Um, but then it's about sharing that knowledge. So you want a day-to-day -day action. You read those articles, great. Now who are, you, who are you telling about it, right? A lot of people are informed about things but don't fully understand them. So a really easy example is I shared my pronouns at the beginning of, of this talk. A lot of people right now, there's a big trend of putting your pronouns in your email signatures, right? Why are you doing that? What's it for? It's not to make trans people feel good. It's about pushing back against cis-normative oppression, right? And if we know that that's what we're doing and why we're doing it, people are more likely to get involved. People are more likely to, to sign up rather than get resentful and annoyed, right? So it's about pushing that informed to knowledgeable. And by reading all of these great resources, you can be part of that change and that shift within your organization, but also within your community. And then the fourth and final area would be about our personal relationships, our interpersonal connections and, and uh, interactions. That's about setting boundaries. That's about pushing back against microaggressions. That is about calling out when you see something oppressive, but more effective than that, in my opinion, is calling in rather than yelling at people, inviting them to have a conversation, sit down with them, explain to them why something is unacceptable or harmful, because they probably don't mean to be harmful. Most people don't intentionally go out of their way to hurt other people. Some do, but not most. Most people believe that they're good people. So if you start from there, start from the place of believing that the people around you are good people, that they're well-intentioned, they've just made a mistake they didn't realize, and then work with them collaboratively towards a, a world of, of peace and kindness. Really just make that your goal. Let's be kind to one another, and that looks different for different kinds of people. Using a trans woman's pronouns, correct, is kind as well as liberating, um, I think you'll get a lot more people on board. So those are, a, I know I've said a lot, but those are the ways we sort of take like those sort of like individual everyday actions. Actually, they have to contribute to systemic change. And that's, that needs to be a little bit more organized, I think. Yeah, wow, there's a lot of great answers from, from everyone there. Um, I mean, I think the, the it made a really important point about like how sometimes you you kind of forget how much everyone else knows about 
an issue. So I, I once went to, uh, I don't know if anyone's read Sean Fay's The Transgender Issue. It's a fantastic book. I recommend it. I uh, went with a cis friend to, to see that. And I was like, oh, this is great. It's brilliant. Like she made some jokes. And I was laughing. She was like, you kept laughing at things. I had no idea what she was talking about. And I was like, ah, oh, it's probably because um, I've been living that space for quite a while now. Um, and it's really interesting how easy. And th this is, this is uh, you know, a, a woman who considers herself progressive and everything like that. Um, you kind of get get lost in those spaces, and you know, there's, I think, some of the points you made about like some of those big changes that to be made are hard. So I think you mentioned you know one option could be revolution. Revolutions don't tend to happen that often because they're, they're quite hard to get going, get started. Um, and also that you made the point about you know making change happen from the inside, and obviously your your lived experience in the the Met showed that's, you know, obviously was not going to happen or, or too hard in that case. And obviously, that mean that the but UK policing is a really interesting example, isn't it? Because the, the principles of policing by uh, consent um, are actually really interesting, um, but that's not what UK policing seems to actually be today. So I think, yeah, there's there's, there's an awful lot of of things there, you know, from the being the knowledge and actually, you know, being being up to the room and, as you say, not just doing the cargo culting of, oh, everyone else has got pronouns and you should that too, but understanding why... You know, if I, I mean, you want to get someone and I get, you know, pronouns back, I'm like, ah, oh, this is probably someone who I can be comfortable with and be myself with. Because sometimes I join a Zoom meeting and I was like, I don't care how I'm going to be gendered today. That's not the point of this meeting. Um, so, yeah, it's really good stuff. Um, the next question uh, we've got is about, you know, we often talk about, you know, taking a whole institution approach to tackling oppression and discrimination. And I think, you know, as, as we've probably touched on in the previous answers, that's not always possible. Um, often you get a lot of internal resistance and pushback to bringing around that, that whole institution approach. Um, so what advice do you have for the individuals, um, as you many of you will be here today, that are trying to make progress and galvanize action, um, especially when there are stakeholders there who aren't willing to engage? How do you, how do, you do that? Uh, I'm not sorry, you yet, right? I'm a... Thanks, that was a chewy one. Um, so how do we create change when there's resistance in an organisation? Um, well, I mean, I'm sure Emma will have plenty to say on this uh, from your experience with the police. Um, but, you know, basically every organisation resists change, right? Because there, there are established structures of power. Uh, people don't like to change whether they say they do or not. Um, the whole point of liberation is that we're supposed to kind of deconstruct the systems that have created these oppressions or have been designed to create these oppressions. Uh, and that inherently involves giving up um, power from a lot of people who really feel as though they deserve to have it. So, you know, yes, there's going to be resistance in every organisation, no matter how um, how forward thinking they claim to be um, and how forward claiming you may personally feel you are as well. So th there's some really interesting self-reflection as much as organisational reflection. I think, look, there's lots of different approaches with this stuff. Um, ideally, you have some resource in your organisation which focuses on something around the work of EDI. I appreciate that corporate EDI can also be problematic in itself, but at the very least, you have uh, a resource that looks towards that. If you don't, that's a slightly different conversation, and that's really about, I think, about building activism within um, staff teams, getting people together and sharing ideas um, that we can kind of tackle collectively. Again, so this is why things like staff diversity networks and trade unions are super important. Having this sense of collectivism to create a groundswell and create change is really, really key. So the more you can do that, I think, the better. If you do have the ability as an organisation to focus more on this at a strategic level, um, even if there is resistance, I think the number one thing that people forget to do or think they've done is to really nail the case for change. Um, and we've really tired out the old capitalist business case. I'm so bored of it. Um, the fact that we have to talk about why it makes money when a capitalist system itself is inherently problematic. Um, it's just really not the, not the vibe. Um, so, I mean, you know, some people do need to talk about why it makes profit, and that is what makes your organisation tick. But I would really encourage you to go back and think again about what it is about being an anti-oppressive organisation or an organisation that works to make the world a fairer place that is just good for people and good for the world when we are facing the things that we're facing at the moment and really try to tap into people's kind of um, hearts and minds about those kinds of things rather than assuming that we've sold that because I don't think we have. Um, and obviously there are other things as well, but I'll leave the panel to talk about the rest of that. Things up. Look at this guy. Um, yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, so. I think for me, those 
convincing people to get on board is like one of my number one jobs. It's it's like the thing I, I do. It's it's very exhausting emotional labor, and that's just something to really keep in mind. So if you're going into that space and you're going into that conversation, may I please encourage you to book half an hour afterwards for a nap? Because like I like it, like I'm not kidding. Like actually like take care of yourselves if you're going into that space. It's hard, right? And then I want you to read up on something called reverse canvassing. Uh, so this was some research done on um, fighting transphobia specifically. Um, and what these people did is, we've all been, like, we all know what canvassing is, right? People come to your door and then try to convince you to vote a certain way. Reverse canvassing is they come to your door and then you talk. Um, instead, of, instead of them talking at you, you talk. So they ask questions. So to be like, what do you think about uh, trans rights? for example, um, and somebody be like, oh, like, trans people are all perverts, blah, 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 right? They're gonna tell you some crap. And then um, you'd be like, okay, great, like, what are your family values? What do you believe in? What makes a good person? Um, and you just work through what are their values, what do they believe in, what are their boundaries, what are their experiences of being mistreated, how have they felt in that time, how might trans people feel in that space, how might they make sure that trans people feel loved and accepted and welcomed? What voting policies are then required to ensure that. And they get there on their own by being at, led these sort of guiding questions. It's called actively processing your values. And a lot of people have to do it themselves. You can't tell people how to think. Nobody likes being told how to think. They have to get there on their own. And that, that takes a process, it takes a moment. And they need to feel safe to get there. They need to be not yelled at and told off. They need to be able to get, like, to go on that journey. So for me, I've been on that journey for a very long time. So like, like growing up queer in a small town, that happens to you. You have to go on that journey, right? Like, but other people don't. Other people don't have to go on that journey, right? But you can create spaces where they feel safe to do so. Um, and so like, um, that, that can be really useful. And then if that's, not, if that's still not working, what I then shift to is being like, fine, you're not on board um, on trans rights. OK, you're, you're a transphobe. We're not, we're not getting past that. So now what is identifying shared issues? So I talked about housing earlier, right? 25% of, of trans people have experienced homelessness, right? So that is also true of white working class people, of people with disabilities, of seniors. There's loads of groups who struggle with housing, right? So you don't need to say, oh, you should care about trans people. What you need to say is, oh, you, you need to access housing so do all of these other people, let's work together, right? So when I'm talking to men about feminism, which is exhausting, um, I will often talk about men's mental health, right? And I will of often just be like, right, well, like, you, you're refusing to be a feminist, which is ridiculous, but fine. Let's talk about the fact that you're disproportionately more likely to die of a heart attack or from suicide, right? And what can we do to mitigate that? Oh, it's fight toxic masculinity and the patriarchy. Great, let's do that uh, because that will save your life, right? Literally your life. Um, and then I get loads of men on board, like you know, supporting feminist causes. So, you know, take what wins you can, I guess. I don't know if I can add to that. I think you both said some really. Um strong things. Um, I think I just want to come back to this point that you made at the beginning around um, looking after yourself. Um, I've noticed since George Floyd and BLM three years ago that it's opened up new opportunity for EDI folk to then start that consultancy that they've always wanted to start or to go out and do the work because there's so much more demand now for EDI, um, particularly anti-racism. As a consequence of that, um, those people are now severely suffering from burnout and fatigue, closing down those consultancies or leaving their in-house roles and, and, and going elsewhere because it's it's tough, it's hard. Self-care for a lot of people looks different. It could be going for a run, it could be going to the gym, it could be um, going to a spa, whatever. But for me personally, self-care is messy, it can be ugly, um, and it's, it's difficult. So my, uh, I guess what I'm saying is, if you are go stepping into this space properly, professionally, look after yourself. Can you really do it? based on your own lived experience and that's it. Can you really just rely on that? 
or do you have the strategic mindset to do both? Use your lived experience to make change, but also gain or, and use your ex experience and your expertise from other areas or your transferable skills to engage people. Because this isn't easy, and I don't think lived experience alone is enough. So I would urge everybody that is going into this space have to have done the work on yourself, look after yourself, make sure that you're healing from past traumas, um, and because it, it can be really dangerous to use your past traumas to fuel the work that you're doing if those traumas haven't necessarily been healed because you could be re-traumatizing yourself. Um, influencing people isn't easy, um, and I... Have I got time to share an example of when I've influenced someone, but it was at the expense of my own mental health? Um, I was uh, a DNI manager in an organisation, um, and uh, it started off really well. All the, th the right things were said. They wanted to make change, um, and they wanted someone to come in and kickstart their their strategy. So I did. I went in, and I thought I had buy-in from the very top. Um, as the months went on, it became clear to me that there were a few blockers in the organization at the top. So it was very difficult for me to take them on an anti-racism journey um, when that is what they needed to go on. And I think they were focused on me working on external programs rather than working on the internal uh, stuff that they needed to focus on. So I started there get our own house in order, and then we can move on to the outside. And as the months went on, it became more and more difficult. Um, I was subject to microaggressions. There was a lot of pushback. There were a lot of really challenging questions from people that I thought I had support from. When it came to sharing the strategy, the draft strategy, to some trustees, um, I was met with some hostility, some tension. Um, they couldn't really understand why we were being anti-racist. Wasn't it enough that they were non-racist? Um, and that there were a lot of problematic power dynamics at play. Um, and I came off that call, I s shut the laptop, and I burst into tears because I wasn't expecting what I was met with. The following day, I was on a call with one of the trustees that was on that call, and they didn't introduce me to um, somebody else that we were on the call with. Um, it was a member of parliament, actually, and we were talking about how we could make our programs more inclusive. Um, and he ignored me, um, but introduced um, the, the sort of head of comms at the time. So again, another microaggression that I had ha that I had to deal with after coming off that call the following day. Then I decided it was time to leave. In the middle of all this, um, the, the chair of the board emailed myself, all of the other trustees following that trustees call, and said that, um, uh, you know, maybe their understanding wasn't what it could have been, and maybe they needed to go away and reflect. I then responded to that email and reached out privately and said, shall we meet for coffee and have a conversation about the call? Uh, because I think we, we, we just need to meet. So we met, we had a two hour conversation, and um, we talked about everything from racism to um, my experiences in the police and his experiences growing up. And he's, I believe he's in his 70s, um, so he's, he's lived a very interesting life. And we connected, and he looked at me and said, who hired you? And I told him, and he went, hmm, interesting. Okay, I don't know what that meant. After the, the, the meeting, um, I felt really good about it. I felt really positive. I felt like he had uh, sort of gone on a bit of a journey. He then emailed everybody, the trustees, um, the people that were on that call and myself and said that after meeting with Emma, I myself have gone on a journey and I'm now reading Michael Holding's book, Why We Kneel, How We Rise. Michael Holding is a, uh, was a black cricketer and he wrote a, a book on racism in cricket. And the chair of the board has read this book and is now going on a bit of a journey himself to um, understanding what it means to be anti-racist and why the organization organization should be anti-racist. So what turned out to be quite a difficult experience for me turned into something quite positive, ultimately, and my outcome was achieved. The organization are now going on this journey, but at the expense of my own 
uh, mental health and, and, and kind of, you know, experience. And I ended up leaving that organisation um, because of that. But, you know, I think that you can influence in lots of different ways and there are so many ways to do it. But sometimes it's not always effective on yourself if you're the one that's coming out of it, you know, in, in a sort of emotional state. So for me, just look after yourself and make sure that, you know, if you are going into this space, get paid for it. Don't do things for free. Um, if <laughs> you know uh, your lived experience isn't isn't uh, you know to be um, used and, and, and shared in a way that educates others, but then leaves you feeling traumatized afterwards. Um, so make sure that you look after yourself um, and and uh, go into this for the right reasons. I think. Thank you. That's, I think it's really important and really impactful. Like kind of story there, a message there. You know, it's, it's so important to look after yourself and also to find your allies and, and checking on each other and, and, and look after each other as well. Um, and I really like the, 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 the point you made about you know, going back to how do you convince um, people to come along. It's like, it's that what I always call the inception moment is you have to make them think it's their idea. Mm -hmm. And then and then it's like, oh, of course we're doing that. It's my idea. Um, just um, a couple of questions quickly and we'll take some questions to the audience. Um, what would you say has been the most successful action, uh, most, most successful action or practice you've taken in your career that has helped push, uh, helped push a, you know, the DEI agenda for that maybe the audience here could learn from. Um, should we start with you, Christopher? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I'll try and keep it short because I know I, I ramble a bit. Sorry, folks. Um, so I think actually I'm going to keep it really, really simple. Um, the 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 number one thing that I have found successful is inherently believing that people are good. That we're all good. There, yeah, there are some bad people out there. There are some people who actively seek to do harm. Um, but most people are good people. And if we can just start from there, then we're willing to forgive mistakes, uh, to guide people gently, um, and to connect authentically and kindly. Um, I think this is work, like not to get a little bit mushy, but I, this is work of love frankly, in my opinion. This is about making the world more loving to marginalized people. Um, do it that way, and I think you'll, you'll find really quite a beautiful world. <laughs> we like Mushi. Um, you might not always have access to the CEO. You might not always have access to the senior leadership team. Um, so my advice would be to where you can, if you if you are engaging with people in your organisation um, that aren't necessarily at that level, um, really invest in those conversations. I did it in a previous organisation. Um, he was the finance guy, and he he came to work every day, did his nine, did his five, and that was it. And we were having the most amazing conversations about EDI, and he was talking to me about mental health and his experiences with his partner and um, the things that he wanted to do in the organization but didn't know where to go and, and felt trapped. In that organization, I set up these DNI drop-ins, um, just an hour, come in if you want, talk to me about any EDI issue, um, I'll be there to listen and we can navigate it together. And they were really informal. Um, when I left, um, they, they died down. He then continued those DNI drop-ins. He took the reins, um, the finance guy who had no real influence in the organization, and he decided to continue those uh, drop-ins with the backing of the CEO and all the other members of the leadership team. And he sent me the loveliest message after I left. Um, oh, I should have sort of brought it out and found it, but he basically said, thank you for those conversations. Um, they really helped him, he really valued them, and it gave him the, um, the, uh, the kind of motivation then to continue what he found really valuable in the organization, because after I left, they stopped. But he took the reins and wanted to continue. He didn't think he had any agency in the space. He's a white guy, he's cisgendered. Um, he, he said, Emma, what agency have I got here? I can't do this. He said, after our conversations, I felt so empowered. So that's the legacy you leave. Leave those conversations, um, uh, don't leave them at the door. I think you should just invest in them and make sure that you're continue it, continuing having those conversations with your peers because they're the ones that can really be the most powerful. Um, thanks, and I'll talk about it in the context of uh, kind of strategic organisational change, I suppose, because that's really my 
what I'm thinking about on a daily basis, which is very boring to some people, but I love it. Um, uh, I suppose for me, the, the the most important thing is about the type of approach that you're taking, especially if you're working in an EDI space, but generally as any organisation, um, make it about organisational development and culture change. Don't make it programmatic. Um, if you start off by going, oh, we're going to change our culture by running a Black History Month, you are so badly wrong. Um, that's not how you change culture. That can be a part of a process that's involved in making your organisation more inclusive or focused a bit more on anti but actually the thing that makes the difference is the approach that you're taking and unfortunately culture change does take a really long time which is why a lot of people try to do the quick easy wins um, the activities the the awareness events the articles um, you have to have someone who understands how to change organizations and if you don't you need to learn how to um, so really I think understand that and take that approach from, from an EDI lens um, you should be trying to design in frameworks transparency and the types of uh, abilities that people need in an organization to make an EDI team completely redundant. They shouldn't be creating an industry for themselves, um, which does take longer, but it makes it more sustainable and it makes it a part of everyone's day-to-day -day lives. You're not there as an EDI team or someone working on EDI to be the only opinion in the space. You're there to elevate and amplify the voices of people who are regularly not heard. Um, so see yourself as a facilitator in that sense or your organisation as a facilitator. Thank you. Um, have we had any questions on the slide? Oh, yes. Do you want to? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, so we probably only have time for one because we had so, so much good thing. Um, so um, one of the questions that has got almost the most votes um, is the time. I'm afraid. So sorry for the other person. Is there have been a number of mentions about trade unions within? Um, uh, the panel so far. Um, oh, oh, so I'm going to switch it because dynamic voting is happening. Um, <laughs> someone has said, my job is to help and support students who face oppression, uh, and they're actually often better versed on the issues, because I guess they've got those lived experiences, than the person supporting them has. What advice would you have for those people who are navigating uh, that scenario? Um, do you want to start, Emma? Uh, yeah, I mean, just to repeat what I said before, your role is to elevate and amplify voices. It's not to be other people's voices. Um, you know, I think learning how to listen with empathy and compassion is one of the most important things you can do. Um, and humility, especially if you're someone who has a lot more power than the person that's speaking to you. Um, having humility and the ability to recognize that maybe someone might say something that's critical about you or about something that matters to you um, is like the number one thing you're gonna need to be able to learn from the people that are telling you things with, with, with uh, deeper lived experience than you might have. So I think that's super important, but also actively making Space for those um, conversations to happen. So there's something called psychological safety. Um, uh, again, if you don't know what that is, have a, have a little look, have a little read. Um, but it's super important to create active spaces where people can um, offer these feedbacks and ideas. Um, in some organisations, they do things called red teaming, where they actively seek out people to challenge the status quo, and that's their job uh, to be in that conversation. But do it in a way which is actively engaging, not just saying we have an open door policy. Um, again, just to add to that, maybe um, just understanding the concept of stepping up versus stepping back. Um, so similar to call in, call out, uh, knowing when to call someone in and when to call someone out. I think the concept of stepping up and stepping back would apply to this because um, stepping up is, is, I guess, being a good ally or being a good advocate or being a good activist for that particular group, um, but don't speak for that group. Um, so stepping back sometimes is, is probably the right approach. Um, and as you said, Emma, just facilitating conversations and, and using the resources that you do have to amplify and elevate groups that maybe don't have access to those resources uh, to make some of these conversations and, and safe spaces um, happen. And I think if you are having conversations with people outside of that space, outside of those communities, the spaces aren't necessarily always safe. They're what I call accountable spaces. Um, and, and that is just making sure that people are accountable for what they say and what they do um, for the things that they're trying to do for that community. So making sure that is uh, embedded in, within the conversation as well. Um, yeah, I really agree with with everything that's already been said. I want to talk about 
um, just addressing the fact that they're talking about students and young people specifically. Um, one of the number one things I get from older professionals is that they can't keep up um, and that it's not fair to expect them to have the, the language or the terminology or the knowledge that so many young people are miles ahead of them on. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a real generational divide. Um, and we need to repair that divide. We need to be intergenerational in the work that we do. And my, my encouragement for people working with young people is to listen and value young people as young people. Um, they have perspectives that matter. They have experiences that matter. They might have less experience than you, but that doesn't make them unwise or stupid. Listen to them, follow their lead, platform their voices, put them in positions where they get to speak to p positions of authority. If they're talking to you about an issue and you know nothing about it, but they seem to be really well versed in it, great, now they're the expert in the room and you're gonna follow their lead and you're gonna listen to them. And that's okay. It's okay to be you know, older than them and following them. But you'll, you'll, you'll survive, you'll be okay. I'd really like to thank everyone on the panel today for taking part in the discussion. I know there's been a few more questions I haven't had a chance to ask, um, but we have sadly run out of time and there are many, many more useful sessions going on today. Once again, I'd like to really thank my panel, uh, the panel here for contributing such insightful insight and uh, hopefully you enjoy the following sessions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Oh, just checking. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you managed to chat to some colleagues at the break there. There'll be a much longer break um, after this session, so you'll definitely get a chance to catch up. Um, this session is on effective campaigning for prevention and better promotion. My name is Chelsea. I'm the head of marketing here at Culture Shift, um, and I'm incredibly passionate about this topic. I believe it's the key to embedding report and support in the institutions that we work in, um, but it's not easy work, so hopefully some of you will be able to take away some really good tips from today. Um, so in this session today, we'll hear from Johanna Kaupi um, from Not On My Campus, one of the most prolific student activist groups in the country, on what it means to campaign effectively and how institutions can do more to increase student engagement in their anti-harassment initiatives. Um, she'll be joined by Gemma Ansell, case manager at University of Warwick, who will talk about how they have successfully promoted report and support, and Leslie McMillan as well, who's from Glasgow Caledonian University and is also chair of the UCU Sexual Violence Task Group, who will talk about citywide collaboration through Fearless Glasgow's Erase the Grey, as well as the importance of the workforce also being aware of and having confidence in using report and support. Um, we'll have some time for some questions at the end, so if anybody in the audience would like to ask questions, we'll come round with the microphone, um, or you can go to slido.com and enter the code 23770844 um, and just enter your questions on there and we'll come to some of the Slido questions um, at the end as well. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. So. First of all, um, if I could just ask each of you to give your opening statements, um, tell us all a little bit about your role and how it relates to the practice of campaigning. We're gonna go with Leslie first, who has a couple of slides to take us through as well. There you go, that's our first one up. So I just want to talk a little bit today about a campaign that we developed at Glasgow Caledonian University and that we've subsequently shared with quite a large number of people across the sector. Um, it's part of our programme of work which looks at how we can prevent and respond to gender-based violence on the campus, which we see as those two things being um, necessarily intertwined. The campaign that we developed, and you can see the example here of one of our, our posters on the screen, was a, an example of co-design between the staff body who work on gender-based violence as a research area and also our students. So we commissioned students who were studying digital design to help us come up with a concept, a way that we could present this information to our student body, our staff body, and our visitors to the campus, because we see all of those as being equally important in, in terms of prevention and response. We gave them a briefing. The campaign had to address a number of areas. It needed to tackle the silence that often surrounds these issues. It needed to challenge myths that are common around gender-based violence. It needed to highlight our sources of support that people could use. It must avoid victim survivor blaming, which we often see in campaigns. 
It also had to avoid undue fear and alarm about these issues. It had to address the full spectrum of gender-based violence, and it needed to address all members of our community. You can see an example here of 14 of our messages, but we now have 23 in the campaign. The campaign it runs on posters, it runs on banners, poll banners on lampposts, motion graphics, which I can show you shortly, it's stationery, clothing, bags. You can put it on all different sorts of merchandise. Initially, we had 14 messages, but we developed nine new ones during COVID that addressed particularly issues of gender-based violence that were exacerbated by, by lockdowns and so on. Now, initially, we signed, used our signposting um, to signpost to our first responders on the campus, but now that we have report and support, we signpost on our, our posters and our banners to report and support, where people can access report and support tool, or they can access our first responder service as well. As you can see, when it runs on the campus, it has quite a, a strong visual impact for anybody coming onto the campus, be that students, staff, or any members of the community. What we found as well, um, that should run a motion graphic. Is that running for you now? Could you see a motion graphic running on the screen now? Sadly, they're not working, but the motion graphics are very useful for social media and digital screens where the, the message comes up, the gray text disappear, and it leaves the white screen text on the screen. But you can use them on social media, you can use them on any digital assets on your, on your campus. Now, we found the campaign got quite significant attention the very first time we ran it in 2018. Um, one tweet alone from a student was, it had 131,000 likes and was shared 46,000 times. Just one student saying, look what's on my campus. Um, we also did a survey with our, um, our university community and we found that as a result of running the campaign, 78% said their awareness about gender-based violence was increased and 62% said they were more aware of the range of forms that it might take. We also find every time we run the campaign, because we use it as an ongoing asset, that, the, that we have an uptick in our reports on the report and support or access to first responders as well. The campaign's run a number, won a number of awards for social marketing as well, which has been quite nice. And we also make it free to other organisations uh, under licence. Uh, you can access it here through the URL or the, the QR code. Uh, so far, 12 other organisations have run the campaign and we allow you to customise the assets to put your own logos on them and so on. Um, as I said, we've taken the view that a campaign doesn't run once. It can't be one thing you just do as a wee drop in the ocean. If you significantly want to change how your staff think, because they are really significant in this area, your students, your visitors, you need to see this as something you commit to long, long term. We run the campaign on average about four or five times a year. We sometimes, we always correspond with things like the 16 days, International Women's Day, but we also run it at times, um, we do it at trans, trans inclusive days and so on, but we also do it at other times where there's not necessarily a hook. And, and slowly but surely we're exposing our university community to these issues as much as we can. We also recruit our students as a basically ambassadors. Um, we, we kit them out in the hoodies, we send them out with the leaflets and so on to have some of the conversations that we heard our panel talking about this morning, uh, to try and engage people, to try and draw out you know, what might be the issues that are stopping us moving forward as an organisation or a student and staff body and so on. Um, now, I present this often as a good news story. It is a good news story. It's been very successful for us and that's why we share it free of charge across the sector if people are interested in using it. But um, I guess just to think about some of what we heard on the earlier panel, these things, it's been a journey for us as well. We started the programme of work in 2012 and there was a little bit of reluctance and discomfort around us having such a visible presence for these issues on our campus. But we have absolutely shifted the way the organisation think in that regard. And I think it's a, a very useful way for people to be seeing it all the time and to try and move things forward. So that's just to give you a bit of an introduction about um, what our campaign is and what it looks like. Um, and I can answer any more questions, obviously, um, if you have them as we go forward in the, in the panel. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Leslie. We'll make sure we share the motion graphic with everyone afterwards as well as full access to the campaign. Uh, really good to hear about how you've been measuring the effectiveness of that as well and some really good statistics there. Uh, Johanna, would you like? Thank you. Um, so my name is Johanna Kelpy. I am a co-convener for Not On My Campus UK. Uh, hopefully many of you will have heard of us, but we are a, a student and alumni-led uh, activist collective working with student activists across the UK to support survivors and student activists in higher education, a little bit in further education, but primarily higher education. Um, so we started back in 2019 as um, 
activists on local kind of grassroots um, movements, uh, primarily in Durham and Newcastle, came together because they realized that it's really isolating to do this type of work at your institutions. It's a lot of struggle, it's a lot of um, barriers and just like a lot of hardships and you can feel really isolated and quite challenged when you're doing that. So we wanted to bring people together um, so that there was a meeting spot for this type of activism across uh, the UK so that we could share tips, share our hardships, share our successes and just learn from each other and kind of coordinate a national student movement. Um, so I have been involved in some form of uh, student activism since um, 2018 or something like that when I became a local campaigner at the University of Aberdeen where I was a student at the time and have since uh, been involved in Not On My Campus as well. Um, so we are, I guess, like a bit interesting because we're not really a one campaign per se. We are more of a, a support network, a place where people can bring their local campaigns if they need support and guidance. We can uh, try to collate uh, and almost be that kind of, um, almost like a big sibling activist, if that makes sense. Someone who can provide some guidance, um, share some experiences so we don't have to kind of repeat the same things. We're not duplicating our efforts. If we have learned some lessons on our local campuses or we have access to some resources, we've built links maybe with sector professionals, you know, share that. You know, the first um, panel of today, obviously we spoke a lot about um, collective action and coming together and that's really like at the core of what we do. Um, so we do that uh, through our social media, we run workshops, we create resources and facilitate kind of connections with um, other professionals. Uh, we've also used our network. We have at the moment over 100 um, members across the UK at different universities um, and we have a reach of probably nearly 10,000 through our social medias and our different um, sort of online activities um, and we can use that as well just to kind of magnify and help uh, existing campaigns reach their those grassroots activists to kind of activate them, mobilize them. So most recently we've been working uh, alongside the NUS and Can't Buy My Silence on their campaign to end the use of non-disclosure agreements in harassment cases in higher education. Um, but we also do a lot of other things. So if you have a local campaigning group, you can send them our way and we'll provide some tips to them. Thank you. I feel like I'm oddly nervous now that we're back in real life, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My name's Gemma Ansel. I manage the report and support platform at the University of Warwick. And I think, I think we've all said it at some point during our kind of talks today, but it has definitely been a journey for Warwick. Let's, that's safe to say, um, since 2019. Obviously, if you saw kind of the media, both national and international. Um, so we did ever so slightly start off on the back foot. Let's, let's be blunt about that. Um, and we did have quite a lot of distrust in setting up report and support. So a lot of what I'll focus on today is the promotion of the platform and what we've learned and what I would kind of do differently. Um, but from the outset, I think a lot of people thought that us implementing this platform was a PR exercise. And um, I came from a student officer background. I very much did not want this to be a PR exercise. I saw it as a huge moment of change for Warwick and I still believe that it was and I still Obviously, I'm still here, so I still stand by the fact that it was and that we are trying to initiate that change. But um, when we first launched, there was there was 1.5 of us, as I like to say. Um, and I actually designed our graphics on Canva myself, and I think we did it with the free version, so just tried to hide the logo slightly. Um, so it was it was kind of very, um, very off the cuff when we first started and we were making it up as we went along. Um, but we've known from the outset that the big focus for us wasn't just raising awareness of the fact that report and support existed, but it was building the trust in the platform and the services behind it. You can have huge awareness of something, but it doesn't mean that you're going to use it. It doesn't mean that you're going to trust it. I'm aware of many things that I would never actually touch or think about using. So we were making sure that we wanted to be trusted. And a big part of that wasn't posters or, um, I suppose, branding or graphics. It was, I hate the word, but networking. And if we could be in a meeting, if we could be part of someone's departmental training, if we could be invited to something, in that first year, we were there. Um, I would say that we were probably doing more promotion and training 
um, face to face or, and online, we were kind of split that year, um, than we were necessarily casework in that first year because we weren't as well known. And that's always been important to us. So the liaison officers at Warwick, we are part caseworkers, but we're also part project officers. And that, that's always been important because we're going to keep that kind of training, presentation, networking, try and gain that trust, try and put that kind of face to what is essentially a face of service when you kind of turn up to an online platform and make sure that people feel like you are going to hold their hand through something that is incredibly difficult. If they've experienced something, they need to, to trust you and they need to want to access that service and they need to know what they're kind of going in for. Um, I think in our first year, we didn't actually know fully what our brand needed to look like or what the FAQs were or what we needed to address. So I am grateful that we kind of waited a year and then fully put that in place and started off with our graphics and our videos. And they've been really helpful um, again, but it's what we've what we've learned. So we try and use the data So we do publish our annual report on an on an annual basis. I feel like I just said that um, we report that and we want to keep that transparency alive from what we got from the independent external review into what happened at Warwick. Um, but what's really important for us is kind of that organic growth and trust. So we created graphics that were shareable because um, I think like you just said, if people do share it organically, usually that's when you think, okay, my friend trusts that. Maybe, maybe I can use that service as opposed to just the University of Warwick saying, yep, use this, use this, use this, um, because you're not necessarily always going to do that. I've written myself some notes so I don't go off tangent. Um, I think always harness that data. You might assume who you think is accessing your service, but what's really important is who is not accessing that service. And I know there's a, a session on breaking down barriers, which hopefully will be helpful there. But always thinking when you're thinking about promotion, who am I not getting to as opposed to, yep, tick that box, we gained them, we've spoken to them. Um, and it's just about making sure that people see you as someone who is knowledgeable, um, but is also going to be there when they need a bit of support, whether that's a personal tutor, an academic. Um, basically, you're the person they turn to, you're the service they turn to. Um, and yeah, we've, we've transitioned from, I think I kind of wanted to end it on, I suppose the last two years, we're begging for people's time. Can we have a slot in your training session? Can we be there to um, this year, people turning to us before Welcome Week and saying, please, can you be there? Um, we can't do this without you. We need a session on report and support. You're invaluable. We need this to be there. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's that moment of perhaps culture change in my mind of, you know, us having to persuade someone to invite us to now they realize our value and they realize that that this is important in the student experience and the staff experience of warwick so yeah thank you so much i love hearing about the work that you're doing at warwick it is always incredibly inspiring and yeah you've definitely been on a bit of a change curve um would you mind us sharing the link to your public uh, annual report actually in the zoom chat and things like that because it is a really great example of good practice as well in terms of sharing um, not only the the data that you're gathering through your report and support system but also um how you use that to inform change and the kind of actions that warwick have taken as well um so i think people could could definitely learn something from that um so I'm going to start off with what sounds like a fairly simple question, but I think there's a lot of misconceptions sometimes around campaigning. So um, what is campaigning and what is the purpose of that for you? Who would like to go first? Um, so I suppose I think campaigning for me happens at multiple levels. You can do it in your big showy ways like we have with the Raise the Grey, but we also are trying to do it at the sort of micro level at every sort of level of the institution. And some of that would be um, very similar to maybe what Gemma said. It's like interventions at maybe within a university at the programme level, um, a departmental level, as well as um, things that are at the institutional level. And I suppose for me, these things, um, like if you, if you look at feminist political science scholars, you know, they talk about, you know, um, change can be slow and then sometimes you might get a big leap for some reason. And I think it's important with campaigning to take those small changes, those small little increments that you see and it's, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, it might sound a bit trite, but actually if we've changed that person's views today, that is something, because that will start shading that wider. But we might then change a group's view at another time. And I think it's about thinking, where are all the opportunities, all the little tentacles you can put out with campaigning? Not all of it is the big campaign on the entire campus. It might be taking a small win, a small gain in different places. And I think it's maybe about planning strategies that go at different levels, I think. So I think with um, 
like you say, like campaigning is obviously something that happens in like multiple layers. I guess campaigning at its core, it's about like a coordinated action to make change in some way. And you know, I think we tend to think of it in, like you say, like the kind of big flashy things. But when we think about ending sexual violence, for example, or ending harassment or ending something like this, we often talk about prevention and things like that happening where that happens. Like we try to understand why it happens and where it happens so that we can kind of target it like in that local way. And I think, you know, we as 16, uh, part of 16 days, you know, we try to reach these kind of like maybe activists a lot. Because um, I think a lot of people, they think, oh, I could never do that. I'm not a campaigner. I'm not an activist. I'm not someone who can do that. But violence, harassment, like they, it happens in mundane places, doesn't it? And a lot of change, a lot of campaigning happens in really mundane, boring places, you know? It happens at kitchen tables. It happens in your halls when you are talking to someone. It happens in all of these little ways where people um, plant seeds of change, of awareness, of something. Um, and I think that's something that we really try to kind of like harness with like Not On My Campus is to make sure that people don't always like students, you know, they don't, they feel so powerless often and they think, mm, I don't know what to do. I can't do anything. And it's like, yeah, you can. Most likely you're already doing something, you know, not to be that way, but I've met plenty of students who, you know, say, oh yeah, I'm not really doing that. I would love to do that. And I have to turn around and be like, you're probably doing more than your institution to be fair. You know, you're host, you're providing support for your friends who've gone through difficult things. You are being annoying to people who say problematic shit. Um, you are doing so much, but we don't recognize that necessarily as campaigning because there's a, a sense of isolation or loneliness or kind of um, individual action. Um, so I think a lot of the times what makes people have that little flip of like, oh, I'm a campaigner now, is actually community. And it's about connecting with community. Um, so I guess like, you know, where you can build that and where you can um, facilitate that kind of conversation and um, I guess a sense of belonging with the, the kind of vision of what you want, like a, a future that you want to achieve and any kind of action you take towards reaching that mm -hmm. is what I would consider to be some form of campaigning. Very uh, vague and nebulous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought that was stunning. I can't really yeah. top that. So <laughs> um, when I think of campaigning, I definitely used to think of kind of the snazzy, like you said, the big canvas campaigns. Um, and I thought that was the only way it could be. But in reality, it's it's influence, I think. And it's it's gaining those allies within your organization, within student movements as well, within the students' union. And it's so that potentially, even when your voice isn't in the room, someone else says, well, what about report and support? What about, what are we doing to tackle this? Or um, shall we have a meeting with this person to try and address this? And it's, it's gaining those other voices as well as your own. So it is that sense of community and collective, I think we spoke about earlier, um, just to try and, and get people on your side and make sure that yeah, when, maybe when the poster isn't there or um, the branding isn't there, that people are still thinking about what is available, what is the support available, and how can I help support this, this cause, whether that's prevention or, or intervention after something has happened, um, and essentially making sure that the best steps are taken before something goes wrong. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely very important. Um, so I want to ask a question now about, about funding. So um, how did you go about getting funding to run your individual campaigns? Um, and also, I'm probably going to combine that with, do you need to spend a lot to be effective? Um, Gemma, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, so to be perfectly honest, at Warwick, it is because of student activism. Um, I am forever grateful for it, <laughs> once part of it, and I still acknowledge it. I think some people think that, okay, there's a protest, and they think, oh gosh, we've got to deal with this. And I always think, fantastic, let's go. Let's have a conversation. Let's speak to them. What would they like? What are the demands? Can we talk through them? How can we shape them? What could that look like? And I think they're always very interesting conversations. I think if um, you have student activists on your campus and you can engage with them, 
Sometimes they're challenging conversations, but I think that's what make works interesting. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be a bit bored in my job. So I think it's, it's about thinking about, okay, how can I engage with those groups? Um, and often in this world of work, you're not normally battling against each other. I hope you're not. You're, you're both fighting for the same cause. You're hoping to eliminate harassment, discrimination on campus. You're hoping to support survivors and victims. You're very often not on different wavelengths. Um, you might have different ideas on how to campaign effectively or um, what they'd like to see, whether those demands are kind of realistic with well, we'll go into budgets, but whether you can do that, if you can do it in different ways, yes, they're, they're perfectly valid conversations, but shutting down that conversation, I think, often shuts down your access to potentially funding as well. Um, but in terms of also gaining funding, the data that you get from report and support is so invaluable. Um, previously, I think, when you were talking around um, campaigns or um, different initiatives in this area, perhaps you were clutching at straws and didn't have the data to back it up. You weren't saying, well, we clearly have a, an issue in this area or this group of individuals um, are being kind of disproportionately affected by this form of harassment. I couldn't have said that three years ago. And now I can say, okay, no, look, there is clearly a trend. So even if you get those people who maybe they don't um, respect the, the qualitative element of, of campaigning or voices, et cetera, perhaps they will respect the data element. So if you can bring both assets into an argument for funding, um, I think that's always really helpful. And do you want me to answer the next question? As, yeah. Um, does it take a lot of money? I think I think the most valuable asset in this, this area of work is someone's time um, and being able to carve out time. Money and branding and campaigns Yes, they are very helpful. They, they will always be helpful. Um, but again, like I said, it has been that, that networking, I think, at Warwick where we do put a face to every name. We do take the effort every single year to literally just make a list of departments and go to every single one of them, divide it um, between our team. Mark is looking at me because I've, I made him do that last year. Um, but we, we divide it between the team and we go out and we speak to people. And it's only when you have those conversations that you will start to build that trust and understanding of what your service do, what it's for, um, and what you hope to achieve. And I think in a way that a piece of paper can't do it, um, but I would say our most invaluable asset that I think we've ever had made um, is, is three simple words, and it's toilet door stickers. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it took me two years to be allowed to put them up, um, but they, Every time you speak to someone, oh, you're on the toilet door. Oh, you're the report and support woman. You're on the toilet door. <laughs> and that's fine. I don't mind being the toilet door woman as long as they know that report and support exists. Um, so there are cer certain assets that you can kind of learn from your Google an Analytics and understand what's been most valuable. So I'm going to answer the question about funding very simply. We don't have funding. Um, the funding is the spare change that me and another member of the committee can kind of rattle up from. Um, so, which is actually the case for most student organizations. We do not tend to be funded. We do not tend to gain funding from universities. Uh, when I was a local um, activist in Aberdeen, we managed to get some funding because we were affiliated with the SU. So we were able to get a little bit of funding through them to kind of um, lead some of the priority campaigning that the student union uh, was doing. Um, and uh, it was nothing compared to the budgets of universities, I'll tell you that, because I was part of uh, some of the working groups at the university as well. Um, you'd be amazed with what student groups accomplish with nothing but sheer will and just determination on top of usually working, studying, doing far more than like a full-time uh, week worth of work. Um, we would um, also do stickers, we would do posters, we would do things. Sometimes we would uh, not be allowed to put them up on uh, toilet doors and we would do it anywhere. Um, anyway, yeah. so we have, I have been chased down by university security for putting up um, gender neutral bathroom stickers. I have um, probably made some university staff quite upset in meetings. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the cost was, I guess, my um, reputation maybe. Um, and uh, it was well worth the price, I think. Um, again, um, it's not free, obviously. It is time, which is um, often money uh, as well for many people. Um, but I do think actually it can be very, um, 
sobering, I think, when you have been in that kind of like student sphere, because you really just make it work, right? Like you put up your support groups, you create your resources, and you get them out there in whatever way you can. Sometimes you are able to ally with someone who maybe has a little bit of money, or, you know, uh, like myself, you graduate, you become alumni, you have uh, a full-time job, and you're able to maybe put aside a little bit of money that you didn't have before, and you can then kind of push that back into these grassroots initiatives. Um, and I think, frankly, it can be quite frustrating um, to, to be doing that, because you'll sit in meetings and you'll hear universities talk about really quite big budget things. They'll be talking and, you know, it will take years for them to even just make the decision to like put up a poster somewhere. And meanwhile, students have like been doing the groundwork often years ahead of their own institutions simply because they just make it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure we're going to be talking more about sort of how you can engage students, but I actually think sometimes the most valuable thing that an institution could do would be to look, for example, at some of the budgets that they have. I know many of them have little budgets for traveling to conferences and things like that, like this, um, and see, I wonder if we could maybe just give like 200 pounds to a local student grassroots group, and I promise you, they will fund like two years <laughs> of work with that little money, which maybe was spent for like one member of staff to like go to like a afternoon webinar to like hear about, oh, did you know that there's like a problem with harassment mm -hmm. in higher education? I could have told you that for free, you know? You can send that money to your local group and they will make amazing things happen. So we basically did ours for free <laughs> on fresh air is what I would say we did it with. Um, so our biggest cost, if I'll put the slide back up, was oh, they're not oh, it's us on the screen now, sorry. Our biggest cost was the poll banners that you saw on the the picture of the campus uh, was the printing of those. Um, I can't remember what they cost. I think they were about £100 each or something. We've just reprinted them all, actually, because we have the new signposting to report and support, and we have 23 messages now. But all of our, our I suppose the cost would be time cost. We've never quantified that. But our students um, who were involved in designing the concept, it was part of a module they were studying called Design for Change. Um, and they were able to pitch the different ideas to us for a campaign, and this is the one that we went with. Once that module had completed, we did pay the students to stay um, with us to work on the campaign, because we would have viewed it as exploitative. We couldn't pay them when they were doing the module, because they were being assessed, but after that we paid them to work with us, because we reworked messaging in line with um, our research groups and so on, uh, to get the campaign out. We do pay our student ambassadors, um, who, who help us with this programme of work. Um, but it's mainly our branding team. Um, so I suppose with our own institutional costs, but our branding team help us when we're, when we're redesigning new posters and messaging and so on. Um, when we give the campaign away to others free under license, we do um, give a little bit of input again at our cost um, to help people get it set up so it's able to run at theirs. But yes, um, we do actually now have some more resources, but it's a bit, in any organisation, it's almost frustratingly like you have to show you're doing it before then somebody will pay you to do it, if you know what I mean. Uh, and that's that's been our experience because we launched in 2018 and we've, we've just actually, we're interviewing next week for a, a gender-based violence prevention and response coordinator who will now help us with the campaign and our whole programme of work. But yeah, regrettably, often uh, we do it for free. <laughs> Thank you all for sharing that. Um, my key takeaway is you don't have to spend a lot to be effective. Obviously, you're all proof that like a lot of really amazing work can be done on a shoestring. Um, but if anybody in the room does hold the purse strings on prevention of harassment uh, at university, please do prioritise some for your campaign groups because they will do a lot with it. Um, I want to just talk a little bit now about uh, messaging. So each of your campaigns act kind of hone in on specific areas. So how do you prioritize that message? Um, that was a question that I already had, but it does tie in with an audience question as well around how can organizations decide which type of oppression to address on limited resources? Um, who wants to take that first? I think if you are in a position where you are trying to like decide which oppression to address, you're kind of coming at it from the wrong angle because it is all interlinked. Like you cannot address, um, 
gender inequality if you are not addressing racism or transphobia, homophobia, um, capitalism, uh, the big baddie um, of our time. Um, so I think it's you know really to think about how how can we look at things? So instead of kind of like dividing all these things, you know, one of our core um, kind of principles, I guess, when we started as well was, uh, you know, in the UK, we have a quite, um, let's say, splintered sometimes um, uh, gender equality movement, feminist movement. There's a lot of uh, transphobia in this country. Um, so a, a very kind of core thing that we wanted to do um, early on was that we wanted to bring groups together who had kind of similar values around uh, an intersectional approach to a power and understanding violence, um, to be inclusive and to be like radically inclusive, to not just be like, here's like a little add-on, but to actually be like, no, what we center will be um, marginalized voices, um, will be the voices that are very rarely heard. Obviously, we are primarily focused on sexual violence, and it is very much um, dominated by sort of white feminist um, perspectives and, and thought. So we wanted to um, really kind of um, move on from those things and to really encourage activists to to read about um, read more black feminist scholars for example obviously this morning we've heard a lot of names mentioned um, that are you just kind of like can can start to address things in a way that is a bit more meaningful because we're not if we are going to look at it and be like oh we're going to do um, a separate thing f to address transphobia and we're going to do a separate thing to address um, homophobia and then we're going to do a separate thing to address racism like you will never successfully address anything because all of these experiences do interlink all of the oppressions the power structure that creates that is interlinked like um, so I think it's just about always in your messaging and in your strategy to always kind of like bring it back to those things of like what who is the most um, uh, affected but also you know sometimes it becomes a kind of quantities game oh well we know that the majority of the people who this happens to is this or we know that the majority there's just well yeah there's so many more cis people in the world like of course they're always gonna like if there's a numbers game we're always gonna be the center of attention but are we actually the ones facing the most barriers? Because the thing is, if I make a service that is accessible to a trans person, it's not gonna become inaccessible necessarily to a cis person. But if you do something that is very, very focused on, for example, cis inclusion, is that a thing? Um, inadvertently, it will probably lock out a lot of people. So I think it's just about doing that and getting that lived experience. Um, obviously, we focus a lot on being survivor-centered, so having lived experience, having peer experience, and really doing that. Um, and yeah, sorry, I ramble so much. <laughs> so I suppose um, in the context of Iraq, this campaign in particular, we made a deliberate decision to focus on gender-based violence and not sexual violence and misconduct, which you see within higher education, sometimes there is a tendency to focus only on sexual violence and focus on consent training and so on. And for cogent reasons, we focused on the full spectrum of gender-based violence, partly we're a Scottish university, it's Scottish government policy to look at gender-based violence across the board. But we also recognise that th these things are all underpinned by the same gender inequality, that, that, that these are a cause and a consequence of gender inequality, all forms. And experiencing them, it, it affects people's capacity to be a full part of our university communities, whether it happens on the campus from a member of our university community or whether it's something happening in their lives or their lives before they came to university. And that applies to staff, students, visitors. And it applies in any organization who might use the campaign. So we took a, a deliberate decision to try to address that full spectrum. We have most issues covered, not all, because in designing the messages with the disappearing grey text, you have to be very careful about how you design them. And there's one or two issues we haven't quite bottomed out yet in terms of a really clear message. But I suppose what I would say is we also have um, anti-racism campaigns, we have mental health campaigns, so we run different ones at different points of the year. And it's not that one issue isn't it, it's one form of oppression isn't more important than the others. But I do think, you know, if you've got four houses on fire and one's ticking over with the members, but one's, one's an inferno, you need to turn your attention to the inferno. And if you can get a bit of traction there, then you can go back to some of the other ones. So sometimes you may have to focus your efforts depending on what needs the most attention at that point 
but you still can't ignore the embers either. They're all really important. And I suppose it's just a word of caution, and Clarissa de Sanchez Humphreys talks really well on this. Be wary in your organisation if people... So intersectionality is hugely important. We absolutely know that. These forms of oppression don't exist in vacuums, and they intersect with one another. But be really, really wary if they want you to just put your gender-based violence or sexual violence prevention stuff, just put that under the gender equality policy and we'll put it in there, or just that, put that under well-being, it's just a well-being issue. There's a really, really important power in naming, about naming these issues and being seen to name them. So it can be a way of organisations trying to minimise an issue by sort of pretending to be intersectional but actually just burying it under a kind of bigger policy agenda like gender inequality and then not being actually willing to have the conversation about gender-based violence as a specific issue. It's as important as the other things that will come under that gender equality banner, if that makes sense. So it's just something to be mindful of in terms of how organisations sometimes approach and, and sometimes minimise or co-opt issues as a result. Um, just kind of jumping on that as well, in terms of the, like you said, making a service accessible, it's about thinking about those underlying issues as well. So I know you get the data from why does someone disclose anonymously, for instance. It's looking at, okay, is, is that concern actually shared across different forms of harassment that are just disclosed, different forms of identities that, that people hold? Are we able to address that in our kind of comms in some way, as opposed to just thinking about, okay, this is about, this is an anti-X form of discrimination campaign. It's actually thinking, okay, how, how have we made this service openly accessible to all and how have we looked at who is not accessing the service what is that barrier have they given us any feedback if we don't have that feedback are we going to those groups and asking them what that that um, barrier is and then if it is about promotion you can promote that accessible service as a whole so you feel like everyone can access it but it really is about addressing any of those barriers and, and really thinking about that in detail as opposed to just thinking, okay, most people are ticking the box that says I fear, um, which is true at Warwick, I, I fear that I, I won't be believed and that's why they, they report anonymously. Okay, what where does that come from? Does that come from their identity? Does that come from the response they think they'll receive? And you can only really get that by talking to um, different liberation groups, groups on campus, staff groups and students if, if your service is open to both um, and having those conversations, but the data will also tell you really important things where you might make assumptions just from working with individuals on a daily basis where you think, okay, no, we are getting um, X people coming through and I am speaking to them every day. You might be, but perhaps the three other members of your team aren't. So looking back on that data, sometimes I'm like, oh, that wasn't what I was expecting. And that's what's really important, just that moment of reflection of, oh, we have missed that group. And sometimes I think we think of identities, but also um, in higher education in particular, like. For instance, this year, I realized I'm missing out on postgraduate students. Perhaps that wasn't something I ever really thought of. I was kind of focusing on, okay, am I, am I reaching particular um, liberation groups on campus? But in reality, it was actually a whole cohort that I need to rethink and think I need to work on our communication with that or engagement with that group. So um, it can throw up a whole kind of load of um, ideas and also prioritization. But yes, I agree. You don't need to kind of pit the different forms of discrimination against one another and rank them in importance that's never going to work yeah thank you all really useful insight there and um, we've got about 10 minutes left so i'm going to go to some audience questions there are plenty to go out on the slido but if anybody in the room has a question um feel free to just put your hand up and my lovely colleague Gemma will come over with the microphone um i'll start with the slido question but then pop your hand up if you want to be next um so the top voted question at the moment is, a lot of campaigns in this area come from grassroots student activism. How can institutions get involved slash support without co-opting? Um, Johanna, I know you wanted to speak about engaging student um, students. I, th I think it's great when universities do want to support um, their grassroots um, uh, organizing. Um, I think it's tricky because most grassroots um, groups have quite bad experiences with their institutions trying to block them from doing things. Uh, I think a lot of the time what they need is access and actually just to not be stopped from doing things. So for example, we see a lot of groups who are wanting to set up uh, peer-led support groups and we know that this is also something that a lot of survivors want, um, maybe because they don't trust a university-led group or because they don't um, 
want to go through the official counselling services or you know whatever it might be. But we often see a lot of red tape come up about these things. Um, sometimes for good reasons, right? You know, you don't want to have students who are completely untrained in safeguarding and things like that be uh, kind of put in situations where they feel really scared and nervous about what they can do. But a lot of times what happens is that the university will go, oh no, that looks really bad. That could cause bad PR for us. Or, oh no, that's an idea that we want to do because it looks bad if a student group starts it. And people might ask, hey, why is a student starting a support group? Why does the university not do that? Um, so it can also become this um, slight sort of concern, uh, but also a little bit of like almost like a competition, if that makes sense. So I think instead of saying, no, don't do that thing, uh, it could be like, okay, well, we want you to do that in a safe way. Maybe you can pay for someone in that group to get training, or maybe you can offer for them to um, have access to university facilities. Um, maybe they can be allowed to put up stickers on the bathroom walls and not get chased down by campus security. Um, you know, a lot of the times it's actually just about removing those barriers because I will say the largest barrier that student uh, groups face is the institution itself. And they might not actually want to work overtly with the institution. Sometimes that can be quite detrimental to them as well because they might come from a completely different perspective. A lot of the trust they might have built with their student, uh, their fellow students is probably built that there is a feeling of institutional betrayal in the student body, especially with survivors, um, people who've been affected by harassment. Um, so really what you want to do is just not be a barrier, you know, check with that group. What is it that you need? What is that's difficult? You know, invite them to sit as part of um, working groups, you know, let them be part of uh, designing campaigns, you know, check with them, like what do they need? Um, and even if it feels big and scary, just try to see what you can do in a sort of hands-off way. Um, just go, okay, you need a little bit of funding to print some leaflets, or you need access to the fresher starting packs so that you can distribute information, or you need a room where you can host workshops, or you know, whatever it might be. I think that's the sort of biggest thing that uh, a university Thank you for that. Leslie, do you want to add something? Yeah. Uh, money. <laughs> really, and money with as few, I mean, beyond the sort of institutional governance and accounting practices that universities are forced to do, money with as few strings attached as possible to support their work. But sometimes, I mean, hard cash is good, but you can, institutions are full of resources like a branding team, a printing unit, an estates and buildings team. Um, you can make those available to your student activists so that they can, um, if, I mean, simple things, they can put your posters up for you, they can print them for you. Yes, there's a cost, but it's a cost that's quite easily absorbed. But actually giving money that, in, that, that student organizations can use to spend it as they see fit is really important. But I also think a seat at the table, but a, a meaningful seat at the table, um, and allowing voices then to be heard and be really having to be willing and open to hearing them as well, though there's no point giving people a seat at the table if it's kind of symbolic only and you don't really listen. And I think um, I think different um, organisations are at different places in relation to that. Um, but I think, you know, I think it was um, said this morning on the panel, I mean, respecting the expertise that you have on your campus, you know, respecting their knowledge and their experience and what they can bring and, and how they can actually make you better as well. So it's it's not a zero sum game. You know, there's should be mutual benefit in these things. Um, I think also go to them instead of wait for them to come to you is really important. Um, if so, every year you will have student officers, sabbatical officers, whatever they're called in your institution, um, and they will have manifestos. Every year, I will read the manifesto of every single person that's campaigning because I need to understand what what they're going to be demanding of potentially the university, the service, where do we align, how can I work with them? And then essentially the minute they're in post on the first day, they usually get an email from me introducing myself saying this is what the service offers. Um, do you want to have a conversation about how I can support you in achieving your manifesto? But in that conversation, I will ask very clearly, would you like, would you like to do this? with my support or would you are you asking me to do this because I think that clarification is also really important is it a demand on the university in which case yes it is my job to achieve that 
or is it that you would like to achieve this and you would like to pursue something, but you'd like my support as someone who does manage this service? Um, and also reaching out to, like we do, different liberation groups and, and offering that conversation, um, not just waiting for them to come to us with, with their demands. If they do and they want a conversation, then obviously be welcome to that. But if you can reach out to them first, I think that's more welcoming than just waiting in silence. Thank you. Um, is, are there any questions in the room? No. Um, with our last two, three minutes then, I'm just going to ask you each, if that's OK, to just um, share a key takeaway um, for anyone in the room who is looking to start campaigning effectively or, or engage with the campaigning groups that are already uh, going on. So if you can just share a key takeaway before we close, if that's OK. Um, in terms of, hmm, I think moving forwards in terms of promotion, I feel like we've we've spoken about it quite a lot, but it is that organic engagement always for me. Um, and how can we involve students? How can we involve staff who are genuinely affected by these these different forms of harassment um, if they feel up to doing that? Because we also talked about self care and, and potential trauma previously. Um, but how can we involve them in the conversation? But then do the work because I don't I don't expect someone else to do the work for um, for me. I just like to make sure that their ideas are feeding in and that we're responding to that. And just being clear that I suppose that question about co option was really good. Um, and just making sure that whenever you're um, producing a campaign and you are working with campaign groups, liberation groups, that you aren't stealing their ideas, that you are clarifying whether you'd like to work together on it or whether um, they would like you to do something about it. Thank you. Um, so those of you who are from universities, I would give you homework. I want you to go back to your institution. I want you to see if there is a local campaigning group already set up. And I would say reach out to them, um, see the type of work that they are doing, and you see what you can do to support them. What are their main goals? You know, we still have a semester left of this academic year. Um, so I would say go to them, check with them. If you notice you don't have a local um, student group uh, that has been set up, maybe check in with your SU, the sabbatical officers or the student officers, and see is there interest, uh, you know, not on my campus, we reach out to, we've reached out to, I think, every single SU who doesn't have a dedicated campaigning group this year to see is there in interest, are there students who want to get involved, but maybe you feel a little bit too scared, and then you can direct them to us, and we will help them. We will help them set something up. We can provide training for them, resources, all connections, all kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, that's what I will do. Send you home with homework, as so many institutions have done to me. <laughs> So I suppose I would say, um, I quite like Cynthia, what Cynthia Coburn says about feminist optimism and that, that like, there's real room for change. Change is possible and institutional change is possible and I think it's important to hold on to that. And I think there's a role for um, insiders and outsiders in that, those of us who agitate for change within the organisation and those people who are outside the organisation pushing at the organisation to change as well. And I suppose, um, I sometimes use this, which is a bit of a cliche, but people talk about, are you kind of half glass half full, glass half empty? And I would say, well, I'm neither. The glass is refillable. So I would hold on to that idea that, you know, it's, we don't have to be um, negative or positive. We just have to keep going and refill the glass. Thank you so much. Um, right, I'm going to wrap up there, um, which is a shame because I feel like we could actually talk all day. But um, are all three of you staying around for the rest of the day? Yeah, so like, please do chat to our panellists. Um, thank you so much. Leslie, please check out Erase the Grey and use the resources. Um, please check out Not On My Campus as well. And if any universities in the room have not yet signed the pledge um, to not use NDAs to silence victims of sexual harassment, then I um, encourage you to do so. Um, and also thank you to Gemma from Warwick. Uh, please do have a look at Warwick's annual report for a really great example of... Um, best practice I think. Uh, it's lunchtime now so if you exit through those two doors there head to the restaurant um, and get some lunch and then we're back here from 1.30 I believe um, for everyone will be back in this room for um, a plenary session on restorative justice. Thank you so much. <laughs> 
For us at Manchester, our students' well-being and their safety, it could not be more important. We've been working with Culture Shift for a number of years. We've had the report and support platform since 2017. Through the system, we get a clear understanding of the prevalence of issues on our campus so that we are able to respond appropriately by directing resource, targeting campaigns, training, for example, in those spaces. We really want to provide a straightforward, easy and very accessible channel for students to report. It's such a large institution, it can be really difficult to know who to go to for support. I used to work in colleges. I have flashbacks of students lined up outside my office. With the report and support, it's almost like that duty worker, that gatekeeper. There isn't one student that we don't see. The report and support team has been incredible. Since day one, I started working with them. There's this genuine commitment and willingness to improve the reporting services that they have. Here at the Students' Union, that gives us reassurance because when we talk to students, we can tell them with confidence there is a reporting system in place. The responses that we've had from students is genuinely really positive. In the first year of having the system, we saw about 200 reports come through and we now deal with around 650 reports. We think that that's a really positive sign that students have increased confidence in seeking support from us and, and telling us what's happened. You can almost see trends through the academic year and think, OK, now we need to start telling students about this issue because it's something that might happen around freshers. And yeah, so it can be really useful to plan preventative work. If you're a socially responsible institution, that involves looking after our people. And that also means being willing to speak up and being willing to stand up. We want a campus and we want a city where sexual misconduct and any sort of discrimination and violence doesn't take place. So it is so important for us that the university is doing this effort into creating a reporting platform that is accessible to students and where they feel like they have trust in it. Hi everyone, can I ask you to take seats if you haven't already and um, we're going to move into the next session. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed lunch um, and you got the pudding. I asked for a second round of pudding to come out because we ran out. Uh, so there are plenty more cakes. Um, uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce the next session, which is our keynote um, on re using restorative justice as a tool for addressing interpersonal harm. Um, conflict in universities and other settings is inevitable, but all too often it's left undressed, undressed and festers and escalating, um, or it is escalated to a formal process such as complaints or grievances. Both routes are often dissatisfying to all parties, leading to negative impact on well-being, performance and continuation among students and staff. When wrongdoings take place, disciplinary processes often rely upon traditional punitive approaches. Convening a panel to determine which rule has been broken, by whom, and what sanctions should be imposed. Many feel that that process, which all too often disempowers, silences, and excludes, runs counter to our ambitions of building inclusive, equitable communities, and to our values of respect, dialogue, and empowerment of others, which shapes our wider institutional practice. And I'm really pleased to offer now the floor now to Drs. Jane Bryan, Amanda Wilson and Imogen Davis to take us through what they've been doing in relation to this. So thank you, Vicky, for inviting us. Um, I'm Jane Bryan. I'm here with my colleagues Imogen Davis and Amanda Wilson, who will be speaking shortly. Uh, sorry. So it's great to have an opportunity to share the research we've been doing around approaches to conflict and wrongdoing that focus upon building, maintaining and restoring relationships, recognising that they are core to our communities within higher education and beyond. Okay. So Amanda, Imogen and myself are going to talk for about 10 minutes each and then hopefully there'll be time for questions and answers. And the plan for our session is going to follow this format. So we're going to have some introductions, some definitions, some case studies around how restorative or relational approaches can um, bring about culture change, 
and then some of the opportunities and challenges, focusing chiefly on the challenges. So my name's Jane Bryan. I'm uh, a reader in the Warwick Law School. I used to be a solicitor. Um, I'm also a mediator and a restorative justice facilitator. I lead the M Warwick Mediation Service for staff and students. Um, I'm the academic lead of the Community Values Education Program, and I'm also one of the co-leads of the Warwick Restorative Justice in Higher Education um, Learning Circle, along with Amanda and Imogen. So if I allow my uh, co-presenters to introduce themselves as well. Yeah, can we get the yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so my name is Imogen Davies. I can't even see the slide about myself anymore. There we go. <laughs> um, I work with um, Jane and Amanda on restorative justice at Warwick University. Um, I used to be a doctor, um, but I left practice about seven, eight years ago. So now I um, work in faculty development. Thanks. Um, and I'm Amanda Wilson. Um, I'm a Levy Hume Trust Fellow at Warwick Law School. Um, at the moment, my work's mainly around research. I'm working on a book project, Restoring Restorative Justice, which is about the relationship between restorative justice and criminal justice. Um, but I also teach a module of my own design on restorative justice at the University of Warwick. Um, that's offered in the law school. I'm a trained restorative justice facilitator. Um, I also work closely with lots of national and international organisations like the European Forum for Restorative Justice. Um, and I'm also a co-lead along with Jane and Imogen in the Learning Circle. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So, some of you may, may have seen the title to our presentation, Restorative Justice to Repair Interpersonal Harm, and, and heard alarm bells, because I think a lot of us think of restorative justice just at that moment where the victim um, meets the perpetrator. And for many of us who are dealing with um, survivors of very significant harm, that might feel like a very confronting um, exchange and something that maybe is... Uh, particularly problematic but I just want to say that we're approaching restorative justice in a, in a far more nuanced way those representations of restorative justice that are often shown in tv shows are the very moment when a victim and a perpetrator meet which what isn't shown is all the preparation and the support that has actually taken you to that meeting uh, obviously it's shortened for dramatic purposes but restorative justice at its heart is a process by which all of those impacted by wrongdoing have the opportunity to explain the harm that was caused to them and to work together to see how that relationship can be repaired. And when I speak of restorative practice, I'm talking about those principles that are wider but drawn from the same um, principle in which communities are focused upon to build strong ties to prevent wrongdoing or um, conflict or where it does ap uh, appear to enable repair to take place more quickly. So I'm assuming most of us are working in higher education and may be looking at uh, instances in an institution where wrongdoing and conflict take place. So we know that it's a problem of quite some scale for institutions. So if we look at the figures of matters that get escalated to the ombudsman effectively for universities, the Office of the Independent Adjudicator, we see that complaints are rising. There's a lot of conflict between the staff and students and between individuals at universities and if we think of those matters that go to the OIA they are only as I'm sure you all <laughs> appreciate this is your 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 kind of day job the the pinnacle because there are going to be lots of complaints that are dealt with successfully or where the parties don't contest them any further because they might have run out of steam and energy to progress any further or they might not have even raised conflict or wrongdoing as a complaint in the first place. So I, as I said, was a solicitor uh, that used to specialise in criminal law and also personal injury. And so I was very used to exporting, really, conflict to courts, either to address wrongdoing or to try and negotiate conflict that arises between parties. Um, and I was aware that even in this adversarial process where there should be winners as well as losers, there were often far more losers than there were winners. And the adversarial process itself 
often caused harm to all of the parties and was often very dissatisfying. So um, I was part of a practice within Coventry as they started to introduce restorative justice into the criminal justice system there, um, but I left to go into academia. And in academia, I also found, um, as a personal tutor, as a member of the university disciplinary panel, lots of conflict taking place between students doing group work, in kitchens, between staff members, um, serious wrongdoings. And I felt that we still echoed that kind of uh, binary of leaving wrongdoing and conflict to fester and address or to deal with it formally. And when we dealt with it formally, often the decision making was externalised to a panel. So I would sit, for example, in judgment to see if a rule had been broken, what sanctions should be imposed. The sanctions would escalate, moving closer and closer to exclusion. And often, however much concern for the harmed parties was built into the system, uh, impact statements, um, the fantastic support that people like Gemma at my institution offer with student liaison officers to support the parties through, the focus always remains upon the wrongdoer and what should happen to them. And very often the person harmed gets very much left to the side. So there is a different way of doing it, which could be considered restorative or relational practice, which focuses rather less on the rule that has been broken and on five different R's. And that's on the relationships, acknowledging that when a, a rule has been broken, there's damage to a relationship. There's harm to the wider community. And there are ways, which Imogen will go on to explain, that that can be put at the centre of how we deal with conflict and wrongdoing. Repairing those relationships, allowing everybody the time to speak about the harm that's been caused to them, allowing people to understand that even if they didn't intend to cause that harm, their acts have caused that harm, and giving them the space to take personal accountability for that, and to work towards repairing that. So rather than uh, imposing a sanction, the parties can come together to try and work out what needs need to be met and how that can be done, with the overall aim not to exclude the wrongdoer, but to bring them back into the community. And the difference would be a punitive, traditional kind of criminal justice or disciplinary approach might focus on what the, the wrongdoer has done with a, a relational or restorative approach, we focus far more on who has been impacted. Um, not on the rule that's been broken, but who has been harmed and how. Not on punishment, but forward-looking on how that relationship can be repaired. And rather than excluding the wrongdoer, bringing them back so that they can be brought back into the community um, and... Um, regain their self-respect and the respect of others. So um, part of my role as a student discipline uh, panel member was to deal with quite a few of the COVID breaches that we had at Warwick. Uh, Gemma, might, Gemma might remember these. So I'm sure in institutions you also had very strict conditions. Our students couldn't move to different kitchens. So repeat offenders would often get escalated to, um, to disciplinary panels and we would be looking at if they'd broken the rules and what we could do to signify our displeasure at that. But maybe another way could have been to have brought into that meeting room, um, that panel, that disciplinary po uh, moment, those that were impacted. So maybe those flatmates who didn't feel safe in their own kitchens because people were breaking rules and bringing infection in. Those cleaning staff that had to go into kitchens knowing that they weren't safe at work. Those community safety or security guard kind of people at Warwick who had to be dealing with these breaches when they maybe had far more pressing breaches to be concerned with. And the academics and the student discipline panel members who were getting caught up in disciplinary COVID breaches, which meant that more pressing matters were being pushed and delayed. Um, so a restorative approach is not to say that people get away with things. It's to hold people to high standards, not to be neglectful, not to let rules be broken without any sanction, but to hold people to high standards, but to support them to meet that standard. 
And what opportunities this offers is that we have an approach to wrongdoing and conflict that puts those that are harmed at the very centre rather than sidelined, that opens up space for everyone to be heard and have their voices listened to about the harm that's being caused to them, um, that puts an emphasis on empowering the individuals to find a way to move forward rather than having a third party tell them what they've done wrong and impose a rule, which can often mean that the people who have done wrong focus upon the rule and how unfair that rule was and how unfair the sanction was rather than the harm that they've actually caused to others. And it might be an alternative to a formal approach or just letting things fester, which focuses far more on inclusion and respect and empowerment, which many of us would feel were the values that we hold true to in other parts of our um, practice. Okay, so now I'm going to pass to Imogen, who's going to talk through uh, a case study about how um, relational approaches might bring about change. Thank you, Jane. So, there we go. Right. Our own motivation for exploring uh, restorative justice is our own conviction that it advantages everyone to have an opportunity, um, to have an option um, in the disciplinary processes that allows for a restorative approach. And it's important because this enables appropriate consequences for wrongdoers, but it also provides something that enables them to be readmitted to the relationships that were ruptured by the harm that they caused. Harm in education usually happens between people who already know each other. They're likely to be in contact with each other on the same course, in the same groups. That contact is likely to continue for several years, and removing someone from that contact with a retributive justice system can have absolutely life-changing and lifelong impacts for someone to be excluded from a university or to <coughs> fail their course. So this is really important, and it's really important that wrongdoers have a way back and that that is safe for both sides of that incident. This is really especially important for educational institutions. Surely haven't we all at some point said to someone, we learn by our mistakes? And in... Educational institutions are there to teach people. We get, expect people to learn from their mistakes when they write essays badly, when they make mistakes um, in their debates, when they don't do a good presentation, when they're late. But how do we incorporate that into how they learn from their mistakes when maybe they get drunk or when they make too much noise or maybe they experiment with drugs? So we need something... Um, that allows an, education, an educative process to take place along with uh, the disciplinary process. So from educational and humane perspectives, we need to think about shifting our institutional cultures from retribution to restoration. But what does that actually look like? What does a completely restorative culture look like? So in a co committed restorative culture, restorative practices are embedded in all areas of the institution. So this is wider than the disciplinary process. Um, this pyramid, I'd love to point, but there are four screens and only one laser printer. <laughs> so you can see tier one at the bottom. Um, this pyramid is from David Karp's work. Um, he's a key researcher and practitioner in restorative justice. So I strongly recommend that you look him up if you are interested in following this further. So he's got three tiers. So tier one restorative practices focus on relationship building. I wonder how many of you have got intentional relationship building practices embedded in your institution. Certainly there's no, well, they, I'm sure they happen, but that, it's that kind of coherence that we're talking about here. Okay. So um, those relationship building um, Occurrences should be between students and between staff, and these are there before anything bad happens. Okay, so these relationship community building um, activities happen in the background. Nothing bad has happened, and as a consequence of that, if you have a strong culture of people talking to each other and building relationships, then when some harm is done, then it seems absolutely obvious that tier two, you would use restorative practices to actually address that harm. Um, and it also means that the culture accepts that restoration is the way forward. 
Um, there's no argument about this punishment isn't severe enough or this isn't an appropriate way of dealing with this or they're going to get off lightly. So um, instead of seeking immediate retribution, then people will um, accept and seek restoration. Tier three is really important because part of restorative practice is an acceptance that people who do wrong should be forgiven in effect and allowed back into that community and accepted back into that community. So how far have we shifted our own institutional culture? Um, I'm just talking from the perspective of our own uh, group, our own learning circle that's looking at restorative justice, because I'm sure that there is other work going on as well. So we've actually done quite a lot as a group. Um, we've uh, taken advantage of our university infrastructure and used our little group. Um, we've invited over external speakers, we've run seminars, we've got students involved, we've developed ourselves, we've made links with interested parties, and this is even before anything has happened with our formal disciplinary process. Um, and yet, I would say that we have changed our culture because we have got this conversation started. So now what I want to do is to just move on and show how maybe an ideal restorative culture might actually work. So I'm going to use an example from another area of my work, which is an anti-racism. And I'm going to weave quite a simple story that I'm sure will be familiar to everyone in the room. And I'm going to weave that story in with some examples of different elements um, from the three tiers that I've just shown you. So let's imagine a situation where a black student, Omnira, is asked where she comes from. And when she says, I come from London, that answer isn't accepted. So we've seen this play out with the royal family last week. But unfortunately, this particular aggression um, has been part of the lives of many black British people for a very long time. And our students are absolutely no different. And we know that this question gets asked. So let's imagine Omnira has been affected by this question. What could she do? So she could make a formal complaint against her peer, and the case could work its way through the disciplinary process. And then the student who asked that question could be reprimanded, maybe fined, disciplined in some way. Um, but they're on the same course. And so that's, they're going to carry on on that course. Um, the emotional distress quite, might well be managed by people in student support. Um, but that relationship is never going to be fully repaired with that process. So now I want to imagine what might happen for Omnira in a restorative culture. So let's imagine Omnira and all of her peers start university and immediately they are allocated to a community building circle. And in that circle, the students all get together, they talk about what being a student means to them, why they are there, their hopes for the future, how they can help each other, how they can build strong relationships with each other. And a few weeks in, it's now absolutely common and uncontested knowledge that Omnira grew up in London and is British. So perhaps that where are you from question just never got asked, and that incident just never even happened. If we also incorporate restorative practices in all the other areas of where our teaching lies, so in seminars, in lectures, um, where we seek out everyone's voice in the room, so it's not just about good teaching practice, this is real restorative practice, then you can see that after a while, everybody becomes skilled at listening to other voices and also having their own voice heard. So we ourselves have started with um, making spaces for voices to be heard. So we've run two restorative circles, one with student leaders and one with staff, and both were very well received. And these were very simple to run because they weren't dealing with a harm. They were just dealing with interesting and maybe slightly contentious topics, but nothing bad had actually happened. So it enables people to actually say what they want and what they think, but there's no... Um, yeah, there's no actual harm that they're talking about. It's a much safer space. So people found this a really, really interesting, and um, a, they really appreciated that opportunity, even though it was quite a simple activity that we did. So now let's go back to Omnira and imagine that even despite our community building, 
that aggression did happen. So by this point, however, it's not two strangers who are involved in this incident. It's two people who already know each other. And so they agree to a restorative conference. And at that conference, also present are probably faculty and maybe students who might have well have um, witnessed that incident or been involved in the fallout of that incident. And the conference allows everyone involved to explain the harm that was caused and for the student who asked that question to take responsibility for that harm. And Omnira may have specific needs now, such as not being in the same placement or group as that wrongdoer, and an appropriate outcome is then agreed. Maybe that person goes on an anti-racism course. They will probably write a formal letter of apology. So now we have to get that wrongdoer back, and they're on the same course. And now they need help to reintegrate. But Omnira really doesn't want to be in the same room as them. But as the whole institution is on board with this culture, the people in the administration department are co totally fine about this and can alter the placements. Now, how often is that such an easy thing to do, maybe? Um, I know that it might not be quite so easy at the moment in the current state that we have um, at Warwick. And that's not a bad state either. It's just the way it is, isn't it? OK, so hopefully you can see that restorative justice doesn't have to be um, a really complicated thing that you can only put into a disciplinary process. Um, the main relationship building aspects of respect and listening can change the way that students relate to each other even before a harm occurs. Um, and I've kind of presented this imaginary case as though like the whole institution has to be fully engaged. But of course, any part of those tiers, any aspect of this can be introduced as we've started to do. So now I'm going to hand on to Amanda, who's going to take up the story from here. Thanks, Imogen. Um, so in this final section of our keynote, oh, and I'm vertically challenged, so I'm just going to do this. Um, we're going to focus in on some of the challenges that come with advancing a restorative uh, agenda in the institutional setting of the university. Uh, though I hasten to add that these challenges, I think, are very much transferable to other organisational um, contexts and institutional settings. Um, now, as a background to this, uh, I want to briefly introduce you to some of the key findings from a national survey we recently conducted in collaboration with the Mint House Oxford. And very briefly, the purpose of that survey was to try and sort of map the landscape of restorative justice and practice across institutional settings in the UK, as this is a gap in our knowledge. Um, and the data from the slides I'm about to, to show is based on a sample of about 28 uh, respondents who completed the survey. Um, and these respondents included both academic and professional services staff, as well as students. So one of the questions that we wanted to collect data on was uh, where participants felt that restorative justice and or practice might be beneficial in the institutional setting. And as you can see from this chart, the majority of people suggested it would be of greatest value for complaints. Um, and that was closely followed by student misconduct. But overall, what this tells us is that people thought that restorative justice and or practice has the greatest value for interpersonal harms or conflicts. Um, but they also, uh, as you can see further down, they also suggest that it might be helpful for issues that affect the broader community, including systemic problems, things like racism. Now, what's interesting is that when we broke down these findings a bit further um, in relation to what students thought, the majority of students thought that restorative justice or practice would be most valuable for addressing systemic problems, things like racism and the like. And then after that, it was followed by things like misconduct, complaints, and so forth. So again, even with the students, it seems like systemic problems and interpersonal harms or conflicts are where students see restorative justice and practice as having the greatest value or, or transformative potential. So in addition to, to thinking about opportunities, we also uh, asked participants to identify 
challenges to adoption or implementation, as well as potential disadvantages of implementation. And what we see here is that there are quite a few organisational type challenges. So things like engagement from leadership, availability of resources and training, things like that. But there's also some cultural challenges with regards to the need to, to sort of unlearn existing ways of thinking and working and relearn more restorative ways. And so with that background in mind, um, I'm going to spend what remains of the presentation uh, discussing two key challenges with regards to the university based on our experience. Though again, as I said, I think these challenges are transferable to other settings. And so the two key challenges I'm going to talk about are commitment and risks. So turning first to commitment, gaining commitment from a change and risk adverse institution like a university is a huge challenge, but it is an important challenge to tackle at the outset. It is, of course, unlikely that a university is going to be all in from the get-go. However, not being all in comes at a cost which proponents of restorative justice and restorative practice need to be aware of and carefully manage. And I guess the main thing that we want to try and avoid is a situation where restorative justice or practice is brought in on the margins to serve other purposes. So for example, where processes are being abused as a means of, for instance, eliciting more information from an alleged harm doer that might incriminate them, and then that information is used against them. So that kind of co-option is disingenuous, it's unproductive, but it's also harmful. So we need to make sure that there is a genuine commitment to a different approach, as distinct from someone in an organisation wanting to lend support to it because they could see how it could be used to make an existing punitive approach, like a disciplinary process, more well-rounded or efficient. And so I guess the idea here is that you can't have your cake and eat it too. Either you're committed to a different restorative approach or you're not. So we need to do our best to ensure what I would call genuine commitment from the outset and to be vigilant when it comes to potential abuses. So that's commitment. The second major challenge concerns risks. Risks in relation to using restorative justice and practice in and of itself, but also, and importantly, risks arising from the relationship that the institution has with restorative justice. So the golden rule of restorative justice practice is do no harm. It's really important that in adopting restorative justice approaches, we don't generate more harm. And we mustn't skirt around the fact that, especially in cases of serious violation, restorative justice could be risky. If facilitators aren't properly trained, the process has the potential to cause harm or more harm to all stakeholders, the harmed person or persons, the harm doer or doers, and the broader community. And there's also the potential for things like further abuses of power, victim blaming, perpetrator bashing or, or dressing down, disempowerment and so forth. But happily, there are things that we can do to minimise these sorts of risks. So things like making sure that appropriate trained facilitators are used investing in the preparation of participants, including expectation management, having trauma-informed counsellors available where required, debriefs, follow-ups, all these things we can do to mitigate risk. There's no question that any process that is designed to work through harm will be difficult, uncomfortable, confronting, and emotionally challenging. That's the nature of it. 
But as long as participants are properly supported, risks of harm can be managed. The relationship that the institutional setting of the university has to restorative justice can also pose its own risks. Let's say that a university is wedded to a particular outcome because they think that it's the only appropriate outcome. For example, exclusion as a disciplinary sanction. Now, if it looks like a restorative process will lead to a deviation from that outcome, they might come in and either shut the process down or try and manipulate the outcome in some way. And the damage that this kind of interference can cause is profound. Not only are participants adversely affected by it, but trust in the restorative process itself is broken. And once that's gone, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to recover that trust. There is also a risk that the institution might adopt a defensive position. For instance, it might become apparent in the course of a restorative process that a cultural issue is the root cause of a particular harm, but the institution might refuse to take responsibility for its part in that. And instead, the harm doer is made the sole scapegoat, leaving that individual and the broader community in a worse position than they would have otherwise been. And of course, the cycle of harm continues because the problem isn't addressed. Now, these sorts of scenarios are ultimately symptomatic of the first thing I talked about, a lack of commitment on the part of the institution, which is why it's so important to establish and test that commitment early on. If you're serious about addressing harms like racism or gender violation on campus, restorative processes are arguably the right path to take and they will get to the real depths of a problem. But the institution has to be fully committed to that path. And if it comes to light that the institution has played a part in the harm, then it must be willing to take responsibility and work through those issues in the direction of repair. So commitment and risks, risks in both directions, are two key challenges that need to be navigated in this kind of work. And overall, we see our task as nurturing and extending already existing human potential through the various activities and processes that Jane discussed, but also, as Imogen highlighted, through things like community building. And that work, we think, is setting the university on the path to becoming a restorative university. So we'll leave it there for now, and we really welcome your questions. Thank you. Thanks. I think we'll take questions sat here, if that's okay with you all. Um, thank you so much. There was so much in there. Like, I think it's going to take me a few weeks to digest um, and think about it all. But some of my key takeaways, I guess, were around sort of why you might want to do restorative practice and actually making sure you've had that conversation with yourself before you go diving in. Another is how making sure we're doing it well and not sort of trying to do it on a blow budget or like with people who are not properly trained and making sure you're yeah being effective and like when when it's appropriate to as well I really took away from that so like just so much to say have we got any questions on the slido Polly yeah, yeah? do you want to um yes if you could bring it over that'd be amazing Okay, so our top question is, um, with restorative justice for systemic problems, are we not asking more of the survivors to fix the issue rather than the perpetrator? Um, that's the first question. Do you want me to read each of the questions and then you can each choose which one you want to take? Would that be? Would you take them at the time? Yes, we can take them one by one. One by one. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you want to pick up the other? That phone should be on. Um, I think as the, if I come at it from a racism perspective, so let's take racism as a systemic issue. Um, it's entirely possible with issues like this that the way that restorative conferences and the way that um, restoration works doesn't necessarily always have to actually include the victim. 
So um, the person f who was harmed, if they don't, um, if they don't want to be there, they don't have to be there. Um, and I think part, I think Amanda would probably say that it's it's only going to work properly if both parties actually want to be there. Um, and there are there are ways around it where um, that voice could be represented in the room. Um, so that uh, the, there becomes an understanding of why that, why whatever happened was harmful and how that harm harm occurred. Did you want to add anything, Amanda? No. Thank you. And I think as well, something we were talking about in one of the previous sessions I was in um, is around like a lot of people don't necessarily want to go down punitive routes as well. So I think this is a very good question in terms of um, whose effort is made. But I think there's also an element around. Yeah, what options people have available to them. And at the moment, I think in many institutions, it feels like punitive is the only option um, and not everyone wants to go down that. And it's interesting that you were a doctor because I um, had this conversation quite intensely with the medical school at UCL um, and they students were said they wanted to see more restorative practices because they knew the people they were studying with, although yes. they were causing harm, were going on to do these professional qualifications that they potentially wouldn't yes. be able to do if they went through a punitive approach. And they didn't believe that they deserved that, if that made sense. So um, I think, yeah, it, it comes down to the when. When is it appropriate? But I think when it could be appropriate, uh, like, yeah, choice is really important. I, I think there's also an aspect to this about who takes responsibility. So if we're talking about racism, it might well be that the institution itself thinks that racism is not acceptable. And so when, when racism occurs, it's not the victim's responsibility to, to kind of respond to that. It's the institution's responsibility. So in effect, it's the institution who, who, who kind of brings the case. I don't want to use a, a retributive kind of word to it, but it's the, it's the institution who says, what you did there was not responsible, you know, was, was not acceptable. Um, it's not the victim's responsibility to be in the room. If they want to be in the room, they're welcome to be, but they don't have to be in the room. We ourselves as an institution can run a restorative process that educates you from not doing that harm again. Great, thanks. So our next question is, um, how do you encourage a complainant to seek restorative justice if they are adamant they want retribution? Um, yeah, hot potato. <laughs> um, so I think it comes down to um, just informing them of what the process involves, what could be potential benefits of going through the process, but also the risks as well. Um, and then um, just sort of explaining that to them. Now, it might be that this person is adamant that they want to go through um, a formal punitive process, and if that formal punitive process is available to them, then that they have every right to do that. We're not trying to force people to do things they don't want to do. Um, what we are trying to do is to open up a space for different approaches and to um, inform people of these approaches, what they involve, potential risks, benefits, and so forth. And then it's their decision as to whether or not they want to take up those opportunities or not. Thank you. Um, and I have a third question that I'm going to ask. And unfortunately, a, a fourth one has just come in, but I don't think we're going to have time to ask it. But I'm happy to send it on, um, or people could come and ask um, throughout the day. But um, the next question is, so how would um, restorative practices work on a staff-to-staff -staff case where retribution for many will be the staff member losing their job and anything less feels unjust? I think I also wrote down a similar question in case we didn't have any questions, which I guess was around um, how does the outcome of a restorative practice feel like impactful or demonstrable in terms of resolving the problem? Is it internal to the people involved or is it something that can be well communicated to others as well? I just added loads more to that question. Um, I'll have a think about the staff bit first. So I, I think I think it can work very well with staff members. I, I think we're all humans. It's only relationships that we're dealing with. So I think that there's no reason why it can't work well with staff and with students as well. And even though our survey seemed to suggest that there was a holding back of feeling that it was appropriate with staff members, um, you know, the research, the theory would suggest there was no distinction. Um, I think there are going to be instances with staff and with students when the only safe outcome is exclusion. 
and I, I don't think this is to say that isn't the case, but it's a working towards an understanding with all of the parties involved that that is the most appropriate way to, to manage the harm that's been caused and to, to manage that in a way that understands the impact upon all of the parties, including the person who's going to be excluded, and just to, to understand that on a human level. That that's and so that they understand the harm, they understand that this is the way that it's having to be managed, and you just, you know, you could effectively feel that you could say, I know this is hard, you know, I'm going to stay with you, I, I understand this is difficult, what do you need to, to process what we've said has to happen, and, and how can we support you with that, rather than that quite blunt, you're excluded, now go away, because then, you know, you're effectively exporting a person who uh, maybe doesn't understand what harm they've caused, feels angry and bitter at the situation, isn't, has not learned anything from what they've achieved and is exporting that problem to another institution to deal with where I think there could be processes that m are more educational and more respectful. Yeah, we Do call it passing the perpetrator. Yeah. Um, and it, we, we see it a lot where people um, often leave before the end of even a punitive process and move to another institution and don't engage at all with the harm they've caused or change their behaviour or actions. Absolutely, and as an employer, there's so little that you can do in a reference to signal that. So often it's those kind of, it's passing the book rather than trying to address it and, and bringing that person to an understanding of why they've had to have that consequence rather than just excluding them and pushing that onto somebody else. Yeah. Was there anything you wanted to add to that? It's very difficult answering these questions. <laughs> this, <it's laughs> I think we're all going, no, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, I, I we're actually going to um, call it at the end of the session there because um, we have a couple of minutes over and I want to make sure everyone gets a proper comfort break to move into the next sessions and be able to use the loo and pick up some more coffee. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, all three of you. That has been so fascinating. And if you haven't had a chance to, um, they have put everything online for this learning circle. So all of the seminars and mm. um, stuff that they've hosted. So I've had an opportunity to attend and listen to some of those seminars. And um, that's how I found your work and, and been really interested in it. So yeah, please do go along and have a look at their stuff online. We'll share it in the after conference details as well. Um, but yeah, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Vicky. So we're about to start this next breakout session. Um, we gave an introduction to Glitch earlier. Uh, Gwen, who is um, part of Glitch, will be introducing her, uh, themselves and the charity in a moment. Um, so I will hand over and not take up too much of your time. But thanks for joining the session. Um, as you know, we do work in, the, in addressing sexual harassment and all forms of harassment and discrimination a lot of the time in the physical space and one of the things that you ask for as partners a lot is how does that translate into the online space so we're incredibly excited to have glitch with us today i know i'm going to be taking a lot of notes away so i hope you guys do too if you're sat in the kind of further corners do feel free to move in closer um but gwen uh has told me that they are absolutely fine reaching the back end of the room <laughs> as well um so i'll hand over to you thank you very much Right, hi everybody, oh, that's noisy. Welcome. Hi, my name is Gwen and I am the program manager at Glitch and I will be taking you through our session today. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, by the way. Um, I've got a couple of little housekeeping rules as we get started. Uh, one thing I will say is the session is a little bit more interactive um, than some of the ones we've had so far. I will be expecting participation. Your participation helps to make the session. Um, and I will be sharing how you do that in just a moment. Don't worry, I'm not asking anyone to come up here. You can participate very quietly if you wish. So, those housekeeping bits. Uh, just before we get started, this is a brave space. I can't guarantee a safe space for everyone because I'm not in control of everyone else's actions. However, this is a space where we're going to be talking about some potentially difficult issues and a brave space is one where we can discuss these topics, have some challenging conversations, and acknowledge how our power and privilege impact not only what we are discussing, but the ways that we are discussing them. So as part of this, please do ask some questions, even if you are worried about them. Do listen to others with the aim of understanding them. And if you want to challenge others, please challenge their ideas and not who they are as a person. Um, 
And just a note as well, kind of self-care is really important. So at all times, if anything we discussed today is particularly triggering or difficult for you, do take a step outside, do do what you need to do. I'm not going to be offended if people get up and leave. And also do reach out to me if you do need some space held at the end of the session. I can do that. Um, so yeah, just be respectful and considerate with each other, respond with kindness. Uh, we ask you not to use offensive language, I'll show why that comes up in a minute. Um, please do give everybody an opportunity to share and again, please do ask some questions. So before I get into kind of the main topic for today, who are Glitch? What do we do? We had a very wonderful introduction earlier on, but to give you a little bit more detail in that. We are a UK-based charity and we are committed to making the online space safe for all by working to end online abuse. And the way we do this is by mobilizing, educating and inspiring everybody that has a role to play in this. So that's from individuals and communities to governments and tech platforms with a focus on the disproportionate impact that online abuse has on black women and other marginalized communities. And we do this through four pillars of work. So awareness, where we use campaigns and collaborations with partners to really highlight the problem of in online abuse and who it impacts. Advocacy, where we work with the powerful forces in tech, including governments, legislators, tech companies, and law enforcement. And we see ourselves as a critical friend of these uh, institutions, where we can provide recommendations on policies, where we can input on legislation, and where we can really hold these forces accountable for creating safer online spaces. Action, which is kind of what I'm doing here today, where we want everybody to feel confident uh, when navigating online and offline spaces, especially women and girls. And we promote the concept of digital citizenship and break down complex topics to help people have that understanding and to take action when they do see online abuse. And very finally is Anchor. Anchor is our fourth pillar and one that we are very excited about, which is how we are doing charity. We're really working to do charity differently. We're working to do it better. And we're working to make sure that we are values driven and we enable all of our staff to deliver their work and achieve our overall mission well. So I've sort of been saying this phrase digital citizenship quite a few times. I'm going to be saying it again and again throughout the session. But what is digital citizenship? It's the practice of engaging respectfully, critically and competently in all online spaces. Uh, this means creating a wider awareness of our roles and actions online standing up for people who experience online abuse, and really understanding what our roles are as good dig digital citizens, I knew I was gonna mess that word up one day, uh, sort of as institutions. Institutions have a role to play in this as well. And we have four pillars here. So we've got digital self-defense, which is using digital tools to be safer in online spaces. So that's for people to be able to, you know, understand how they can take control of their privacy, where they are online, what tools are available to them to have that control over their online spaces. We also have online active bystander. I'm sure many of you have heard of active bystander interventions. This is how we apply those lessons online. So what can you do if you see online abuse? And we'll be talking about that quite a bit today. Finally, not finally, thirdly, digital self-care, which is setting and communicating our boundaries in digital spaces helping us to have more positive, respectful experiences online. And very finally, tech accountability, which is where we hold the powerful forces in tech accountable for creating safe online spaces. And that isn't just Glitch's work, that's everybody's work. That is all digital citizens' work. So today we're mostly gonna be talking about online active bystander and what that means for you as institutions and organizations. Um, but we do offer training on these other pillars of digital citizenship and really do come and talk to me about those if you would like to learn some more. So I mentioned interactivity and this is how we're going to be interacting today. We are using Mentimeter. For those of you who don't know, it's an interactive tool that allows you to contribute to these sessions anonymously. You can ask questions throughout the session. I've got it up here so I can see the questions as they come in. And uh, it will be a variety of different things, including ways for you to sort of share ideas, ways for you to vote on certain things. So please do scan the QR code um, that's on the screen now or go to menti.com and pop in the code that is there. And for those of you who are watching on Zoom, 
you are able to participate with this as well. Anything you share will be sort of available to me. I'll give you two minutes, probably not even two minutes, uh, to join. Um, if anybody has any problems, just kind of wave at me frantically and I can try and help. Oh no, problems, frantic waving. Yeah, yeah, if you can, that'd be great. <laughs> no frantic problems, no frantic waving? All good, no, sorry. It's, let me throw in new technology at you in the afternoon after a morning of sessions. Um, okay, I will move forward then. Um, oh, I'm getting my little hearts, thank you. They make me incredibly happy. Oh, so many of them now. I'm thoroughly distracted by this. <laughs> it's never done the different colors before and that's really exciting to me. Amazing, we've got people connected, fantastic. I will be moving forward and uh, again, frantically wave at me if you have any problems, I will try and help. But before we start, I kind of like to get a feel of how people are in the room, like how are they feeling about what I'm about to talk to them about? Because then I can ask you again at the end and be like, oh look, how effective was this session, hopefully. Um, so before we start, I have some sort of sentences on the screen. So I'm aware of the different types and tactics of online abuse. Uh, I understand how my organization can support someone experiencing online abuse. And I understand how my organization can uh, be prepared to deal with online abuse. Okay, so we've got people are quite confident about the types and tactics, which is great because I'm not focusing on that today. Um, kind of in the middle for the other ones. And now I'm just watching those move as well. Okay, I'll give maybe 30 more seconds, probably not even that, 30 seconds of teacher time, which is about 15 seconds real time. Okay, I'm gonna move forward. Thank you everybody for contributing to that. Luckily we are focusing on what we can do to be prepared and also what we can do when somebody does face online abuse. Um, yeah, but one thing that I really just want us to take a minute to do uh, is to really think about where we get joy online. I come and do these sessions quite a bit and I'm talking about all the things that are happening online, all the negativity that we're seeing, talking about online abuse constantly. And one thing I really want us to do to ground ourselves here is why are we doing this? Why do we want to be online? What are the benefits? Why do we want people to be happy and be safe online? Um, so on the Mentimeter, you should be able to just put in like what it is. For example, for me, uh, I'm really basic. It's cat memes. Um, just, I really, really like being able to just look for cute things when I'm feeling down. My friends send them to me all the time. We have like a group chat that's literally like pet pictures. It's amazing. It makes me feel good. And that's why I want to be online. I am also a gamer, so I really want to just be able to just relax when I'm doing that and not have to worry about abuse. Um, so yeah, those are where I find joy online. And we're seeing cats coming up quite a lot. A sense of community, yes, incredibly important and one that I will be talking about quite a bit. Dog reels, connecting with people, connection, creativity. Oh, it just keeps moving, this is excellent. Wonderlust, distraction. Being in my group chat, yeah. And I think this is really pulling out, like a lot of us are online for connection, to reach out to other people, to make those connections with people and online abuse really is a barrier to this. So this is why it's incredibly important that we look about how we can deal with it. I'm gonna move on, but thank you very much. Oh, it, ke it just keeps going. Yeah, connection, inspiration, and cats. The internet in a sentence, I feel. So very briefly, I'm gonna talk you through online abuse and its impact because part of the reason that we're here today is that we need to understand how impactful online abuse is and who it is impacting. Um, so I will take you through this very briefly, but essentially, you need to be able to take action when you see it, to recognize it, and to be able to recognize who is most impacted so you can more effectively support them. So on the screen, we're probably all really familiar with the term online abuse. I mean, I've said it about 20 times in the last 10 minutes. So what exactly does it mean to you? I'd like you to take a moment to consider 
and complete the sentence that is on the screen. Online abuse is. I'm not expecting a textbook definition, but what does it mean? I haven't shown you yet because I don't want people copying from each other. Okay. So we've got things like unacceptable, trolling coming up a lot. Trolling is a type of online abuse, absolutely. Bullying people, it's unsettling. Abusive behavior that takes place in online spaces. Behavior online that makes people feel unsafe, devalued or targeted. Um, and taking away freedom. It's not actually letting me scroll, which is really unhelpful to read the more of them, sorry. Oh, thank you very much. Um, inappropriate language, we've got revenge porn coming up. It's normalized, absolutely. Often hidden, hurtful. Yeah, I think these are all like really picking up on how we define online abuse. And at Glitch, it's an umbrella term uh, that encompasses the various forms and tactics of abuse, intimidation, and violence in online spaces. And this can range from trolling to threats of physical violence. Online abuse manifests in numerous ways, with new forms appearing constantly, which is part of the reason it can make it so hard to deal with. Um, so there is no boundary between online abuse and offline abuse. Online abuse has very real offline consequences, and that is incredibly important to remember as you think about how your institution can deal with it. So on the screen now is a list of forms and tactics of online abuse. Um, this was taken from the Women's Media Project, uh, who have a really great list of resources on this. Um, as you can see from this, it manifests in so many different ways. And because these new forms are appearing constantly, it can feel like a bit of an overwhelming task. So the things that I'm going to give to you today are principles to work with. I'm not going to be talking about how to deal with one specific type of online abuse. Um, if you do have any questions about the types, do come and find me at the end. Um, if I let people ask questions now about this, we could be here for 20 minutes sometimes. Um, so do come and find me if you would like to talk and have some clarity about more of them. But just very importantly, you should be able to vote on your Mentimeter now uh, for the missing numbers. And this is a number between zero and 100 for the sentences on the screen, which are what percent of women in the US have been harassed on social media? Uh, black women are how many percent more likely to be mentioned in problematic and abusive tweets than white women? What percentage of female journalists have been harassed online at least once? And what percentage of LGBT plus people have experienced hate crime and hate speech online in the last five years? I'll give you just a couple of minutes to think about that. guesses are very close from what I can see. Okay. So we've got you saying about 76% of, of women in the US have been harassed on social media, with 77% uh, black women are 77% more likely to be mentioned in problematic and abusive tweets than white women. 81% of female journalists have been harassed online at least once, and about 84% of LGBT plus people have experienced hate crime and hate speech in the, online in the last five years. I will show you the real statistics just now, um, but it just goes to show that the, the fact that you're guessing how high these numbers are, that we're aware of who is most impacted. So it is in fact 81% of uh, women in the US have been harassed on social media. Black women are 84% more likely to be mentioned in problematic and abusive tweets than white women. 66% of female journalists have been harassed online at least once. And 80% of LGBT plus people have experienced hate crime and hate speech online in the last five years. The reason we go through these statistics is to demonstrate the intersectional nature of online abuse. 
women are far more, li far more likely to be impacted by online abuse, and this becomes worse when women are from other marginalized identities. So when you are a black woman online, when you are a queer woman online, when you are a black queer woman online, that all of those impacts compound. And so when you are looking at the interventions that you are doing, it's really important to consider and listen to the voices of those being most impacted. And I sort of mentioned before that online abuse has very real offline consequences. And I just want to take you through some of these now to demonstrate why we need to be taking action on this. Uh, so for example, uh, online abuse impacts mental health. Uh, it can lead to feelings of stress, self-harm, anxiety, and can lead to people contemplating suicide. So it is incredibly detrimental to people's mental well-being. And even though it's something that they're reading online, it is really impacting how they are feeling. It really limits uh, speech and expression. So it has a silencing effect, which prevents already marginalized communities from expressing themselves online and expressing their rights. So for ex it can lead to people hiding their identities in online spaces to feel safe. Um, it can lead to people seeing uh, sort of, oh, I'd like to be a politician and then seeing the abuse that politicians get and going, that's not for me. Um, it can lead to people sort of stepping away from leadership roles. So it really limits what people are saying. It can make domestic abuse worse where online means are sort of used to perpetrate intimate partner violence. Um, and so we really need to think about that when we're looking at how to address her, uh, sort of abuse within relationships. And it can reduce representation in public life. So again, that people seeing identities the same as them being harassed may lead them to rethink their career choices and the opportunities that they go for. Uh, two other consequences that came recently from our founder's book, uh, which is How to Stay Safe Online by Shay Akiwowo, I highly recommend it, uh, where she noted that there are real impacts to our physical health. Um, online abuse can really cause a lot of stress in our bodies, which can lead to the risk of things like heart disease, gastrointestinal issues, um, and a weakened immune system, sort of having that constant stress. And when online abuse, when you feel like you can't get away from it, your body is in that high stress. So it d is a real health and well-being impact. And then finally, that kind of financial and reputational impacts for many people in public life. So when we're thinking about people like activists or student activists or campaigners, um, you need to be online to be effective in that. And so if you are having to step away for your well-being or because of a torrent of abuse, then you are sort of having a lack of work opportunities. You are not reaching the communities that you need to be reaching. So it's really important that we are looking at how to look after each other in these spaces. Which brings us to online active bystander. So an online active bystander is someone who safely intervenes when supporting a person experiencing online abuse. This can range from things like reporting harmful behavior, offering support to the person experiencing abuse, and educating others on how to intervene safely. And we do have workshops and resources on that. Um, but in this session, we're going to look a bit more about how organizations can be online active bystanders. And that's through their social media teams, through HR teams, through anybody offering those support roles. And just to get you kind of thinking about that, um, I've got a scenario from you on the screen right now. And I encourage you to either talk amongst yourselves on your tables. Uh, I'll give you like two or three minutes to discuss this. If you're in the Zoom room, have a discussion in the chat. Um, but to explore what you could do as an organization to be an online active bystander, we have this scenario. So a student at your institution is experiencing online abuse. From what you can see, a lot of the abuse is not from other students, but from the general public or anonymous accounts. And they've come to you asking for support. What would you do? So I'm going to give you like two or three minutes to either have a think to yourself or have a discussion on your tables if you so wish, especially if you're with people from the same organization. That might be quite useful to do. Um, to think about what you would do in this scenario. And then please do share your ideas on the Mentimeter. And I will be quiet for maybe two minutes. Okay, if I could ask you to round up your conversations. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm aware that sort of two to three minutes is not enough time to solve the systemic issue, but I really hope we got somewhere. Before I go to the sort of the suggestions that people have put in on Mentimeter and from the Zoom, I'd really like to ask if anybody in the room would like to share an insight from their conversation, uh, 
Kenya has the wonderful microphone that we're now going to make roaming, which is very exciting. Um, oh, it is on. Thank you. <laughs> Should I start with our yeah, table? Yeah, please. Does anybody here want to? Oh, yeah, sure thing. Um, so I know it says student, but we actually had a staff yeah. issue. So I work at the, um, sorry, I'm Mariam Namtak, and I work at the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. So we had a lot of researchers working on COVID, um, which meant that a number of our quite high profile researchers were on the news regularly and mm -hmm. were just mercilessly trolled on Twitter. Um, a lot of whom were from anonymous accounts or from accounts that we couldn't necessarily track or generally didn't have any control influence over. Yeah. Um, and so the way that we dealt with it in the institution was to give the individuals social media training, um, some training around online parameters, but it basically was couched in um, self-care and support and how they yeah. could look after themselves in that space. Um, depending on what was being said, obviously if it was like criminal, like death threats, then that could be escalated. But if it was just a bit nasty or a bit mean, you know, they could block them. But for some of them, the frequency of report of yeah. um, things that were coming in, so it was just, you know, advising them not to engage or not use the platform or just get them to be empowered in how they would be most comfortable in that online mm -hmm. space. So it wasn't necessarily a clean solution, but yeah, yeah it's tricky. No, and it is, it's incredibly difficult. And I think that's kind of the response that we see from a lot of institutions is that kind of, what can you, the individual do? Like, here's our advice, block these accounts, like deal with this, deal with that, which puts that onus on the individual versus what support as an institution could we actually offer? Um, but sort of social media training is absolutely one thing that is really vital and important. Um, so thank you for sharing. Is there anybody Any else? other groups? One of the other things that um, our table was discussing was involving um, third party agencies like the police mm -hmm. um, and getting them to have conversations where they were able to identify people. There was a bit of conversation around how you deal with situations where individuals aren't identifiable or where they are identifiable, but the comments that they're making and their online persona isn't affiliated with the university at all. Mm -hmm. So what's the remit of organizations in that respect? Just more from mm -hmm. over there. Anyone else? Oh, we're a quiet room today. <laughs> Fine, it's the afternoon, I'll give you it. Um, but I think that's, again, like something really important to bring up is that um, that kind of there isn't really an easy solution. And the tips I'm gonna give you are going to take work by your institutions to implement them properly. And also they might not work for every institution. And it's really those who have that well-being capacity, like that well-being responsibility, really need to think about what, how they can offer help and what might be the most effective in that case. I'm just gonna go on the Mentimeter to see uh, with doing offering reassurance and a chance, a space to speak freely um, and explore how it's impacting them. I think that's really important to be given that space to talk about, hey, this is, this is really shit. This is horrible and I feel really bad and I need somebody to talk to who can help me just let those feelings out. Uh, signpost to glitch, absolutely. Please do signpost to us. We offer a whole range of workshops and training that might be very suitable for this incident. Uh, we also have lots of excellent online resources. Um, we've got, thank you so much. Uh, we've got signposting again to that emotional support, referring to online courses. Uh, what is going on may mean that they are spending so much time online. Um, yes, it, it can become very overwhelming. Um, but again, I just want to reiterate that for many of us, especially uh, in research and in campaigns, being online is a huge part of that role now. Being able to speak online about the research you're doing, being able to speak online about the campaigns you're running, it's where we get it out and often it's actually used as a measure of success by some institutions now. So if we are using that as a measure of success, we need to be able to support the people who are online. So we have five actions from Glitch, uh, which we would suggest. And I'm gonna go through these all in a little bit more detail now, but these are publishing statements of solidarity, uh, continuously amplify, which I'll explain, liaise with the authorities, use your influence and provide support. So to start off with, with number one, the publishing a statement of solidarity. So if somebody is facing online abuse, public support can really mean a huge amount. 
So publishing a statement of solidarity with the victim. So like if one of your staff or supporters is facing online abuse, the org like the institution, whether that's the institution as a whole or the specific department, posting a statement being like, hey, we see what's going on and that isn't okay. And we will be doing what we can to mitigate this and support the person. But just having that public statement, knowing that it is unacceptable can mean a huge amount to somebody experiencing online abuse. Because if the institution isn't vocal about it, isn't upfront about it, it just becomes accepted. It just becomes normalized. So publishing the statement of solidarity is really important. One thing we will suggest for this is not to make reference to the contents of abuse or post the screenshots of the abuse. That's unnecessary. Focus on amplifying the voice of the person receiving the abuse. Also very importantly, talk to them before you do this, get their consent. They may not want this, but it's a really important stage. So kind of leading onto that is continuously amplifying the voice of your staff, clients, students, and supporters online. So continuously amplifying, even when there isn't an incident of online abuse, really uplifts the voices of your community and shows that public support. Don't limit this to just when they're experiencing online abuse. By like continuously amplifying, not only are you helping your community to reach a bigger audience of like-minded individuals and supporters, it means that if you do amplify their voices during a period of abuse, it doesn't feel like it's just part of the procedure. It doesn't feel like it's tokenistic. It is just part of what you do anyway. Amplifying the voices during periods of online abuse can also help to stop the silencing effect and to change the ratio of abuse to support the person is experiencing. So often one of the aims of trolls or abusers online is to really silence the positive voices and to just bring out that hate-filled content. So but this amplification and the amplification with the power behind an institution's account can be really impactful. So we highly recommend continuously amplifying the voices of your staff, supporters, etc. cetera. Uh, one other uh, tip is to liaise with the authorities. And this was mentioned uh, in some of the feedback there. But with permission of the person, help liaise with the authorities because dealing with the authorities can be incredibly stressful and the help of an employer or an institution can A, ensure the report is taken seriously and B, really improve the well-being of the person having to do this. We've seen cases where like individuals have reported really significant online abuse that, to the police and no action has been taken, but the minute that an institution gets behind it, suddenly things start to happen, things get moving. So think about the power that your institution has and how you can use it. Um, one other thing, again, not everybody is comfortable with the authorities. The authorities are not a safe space for everybody. So this is why it is incredibly important to get the permission of the person experiencing the abuse and to think about alternative places you may go for support if the authorities are not an option. There are some organizations in the UK um, that can help deal with specific incidences. Uh, so like the Revenge Born Helpline with intimate image abuse. Um, the other one has just flown directly out of my head. Uh, the Susie Lampard Trust can help deal with issues of cyber stalking. So really thinking about other places you might go to get that support is vital. Next step is to use your influence. And I've kind of been putting this throughout everything that I've been saying, but escalate the issue to the social media companies, organizations with large followings or influence, talking about what is happening publicly and tagging the social media company can really lead to the company taking action. We've had it before at Glitch where like we sit on some of the safety councils for the sort of social media platforms as they exist at the moment. And um, when we've had people reach out to us, like people from our community going, hey, I've reported this, nothing's happening. I'm like being silenced. When we've kind of tweeted, hey, or not tweeted or on Instagram or whatever, like, hey, at social media company, why aren't you doing anything about this? Suddenly action starts to take place. So think about the power that your institution has and what you can do. The response can really feel inadequate and leave a person feeling unsupported when individuals are reporting. Um, so yeah, just trying to do what you can with that power and influence. Again, not reposting the abusive content. We don't need to generate more of it. And then very finally on the kind of uh, tips on active bystanders for organizations is to provide support. 
This stage is really important, especially if the person uh, experiencing abuse is an employee or a re representative of your organization. Um, so being prepared, so like doing a risk assessment anytime somebody's engaging in, in an activity that may lead to instances of online abuse. So if they're speaking about a particularly uh, sort of, what's the word, debated topic, if they're speaking about something, for example, when sort of working on COVID and we saw an increase in incidences of online abuse to researchers talking about COVID, thinking about, okay, actually what they're talking about here might garner some attention, might attract some of that hateful content. What's the risk? What have we got in place to mitigate that risk? How can we support the person? So it can look like things like counseling, somebody to talk to, it can also be offering to help manage the social media account of that person with their consent, of course. But often one of our top tips at Glitch is to document online abuse so that if you do report it, you have the evidence base. Somebody going through online abuse doesn't want to then go and look through it again to document it. So maybe that's support that your organization can offer. But just thinking about what is realistic now and what you would love to have aspirationally in the future to support somebody like this. And just not thinking of it too differently from any other cases of harassment or abuse that are happening offline. How can you sort of adapt those principles to online abuse? I'm going to pop onto like the final bit and then there it will be plenty of time for questions, but please do use Mentimeter to ask questions throughout the session. I am looking at it. Um, but sort of some top tips from us now on how to be champions of digital safety and well-being. So these are some top tips to have for internal policies and procedures to help you respond to instances of online abuse. Uh, and there are systems to put in place to be better prepared if it does happen. So one tip that we really have is to create a social media code of conduct. Uh, this is Glitch's example on the left. I will read it out in more detail. But a social media code of conduct or a social media policy is something that is easily accessible on either your website or your social media pages. And it states clearly what action will be taken in response to incidences of online abuse. This is suitable for both individuals and organizations. It should cover what the social media page is for, what isn't acceptable on your page, and what you will do if the code of conduct is broken. So for example, we do not accept racist or hateful language on the page directed at an individual or otherwise, people using that language will be blocked. So on Glitch's one, you can kind of see, like this is where we use our page to share news and updates from Glitch. Here's where you can get in touch about anything else. So an alternative form of contact. Uh, this account is a positive space and like any abusive comments, no matter who they aimed at will be reported and the user will be blocked. And this includes, and it's not limited to, abuse based on identity, trolling, threats, doxing, use of deep fakes, hate speech, dead naming, pornographic content, impersonation, and violent content. The list always gets longer. Um, and then it's just got sort of some read more on exactly what we will do. So for example, deleting spam. Uh, we reserve the right to block and mute anonymous accounts. Uh, why we phrased it like that, rather than being like, we outwardly block anonymous accounts, is that anonymity online can be used for people from marginalized groups to be safe when engaging online. We do not want to exclude those people from our spaces. So we give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And then the minute an anonymous account is used for abuse, it can be blocked. Um, I saw a really great example from uh, a politician whose sort of Facebook guidelines said something along the lines of, um, like you may not like me or my politics, but I'm a human being and I deserve respect as much as everyone else. And I thought that was quite a nice way to phrase it. So really have a conversation internally. What is the social media page for? Like what isn't acceptable and what actions are feasible for you to take if incidences of online abuse do happen? Oh, that's a really great question that's come up. Sorry, got thoroughly distracted. I will answer that at the end. So the next one is to be prepared. Um, a lot of the time when I'm talking to sort of uh, individuals who've experienced online abuse and have had a lack of support from their organization, it's just the organization didn't really have much in place. So they didn't know what to do. And by the time they'd made decisions, it was too late. The harm had happened, the harm, the impacts had been caused. So what do we do with that? So one of the things we say is that 
when you're doing that risk assessment about engaging in topics that are particularly um, like where there are risks of receiving abuse, preparing a public statement in advance and be clear about what is available to those targeted in that public statement is really, really important. Um, so to give an example, there was an organization that Glitch was working with. They paid for us for a workshop and we were like, they're not entirely values aligned, but we need to think about, okay, what happens if we start to get abuse because of this? And so we prepared a statement ahead of time to say, we're aware, this is, this is our public statement, and it was ready. It didn't happen, but it meant that there wasn't that stressful like scrambling to get something together in the case of an incident of online abuse. So really thinking about what could your statement include and how to respond to that. And then finally, developing some clear internal policies. Um, we see a lot of organizations who have really good policies or like really impactful policies on abuse but it doesn't quite cover the nuances and cover the sort of differences with online abuse. So ensure that your policies really recognize that people from marginalized groups are more at risk of online abuse. Think about ways you can support those who may be viewing online abuse frequently as part of their role. We see often that like social media managers, are the ones looking at online abuse, even though it's not directed at them, they are still impacted by it. And so it's really important, important to consider in those roles. Okay, this person is reading it. What have we got in support from them? Do they know who they can talk to if they are being impacted? Do they know it's okay to go and take breaks? Do they know who they can talk to if the abuse is directed at part of their own identity and it is too much for them to be looking at? Is there somebody else to support them? I think it's incredibly important. In that policy, have clear guidelines on what support you can offer. So again, you're not sort of questioning at the time. So things like, here's where they can go for counseling. Here's who can support them in managing that social media account. Uh, here's, oh look, a cybersecurity expert that we can work with to help them to make sure the privacy on their accounts is perfect. Things like that. Um, processes for offering support without people needing to ask for it. People, like, there's a lot of people who will struggle to put themselves out there and go, hey, this online abuse is really impacting me or this incident that is happening online is really impacting me. So when you are talking to people who are working online, campaigning online or being involved online, thinking about what check-ins do you have available? What systems do you have available to give them the space to bring it to you if they need to? And then finally, really considering how to support somebody without disempowering. And I think this is really linked to a lot of the things that were coming up in earlier sessions today. So experiencing online abuse in itself can be incredibly disempowering. And it's really important that any interventions or actions used to support someone experiencing online abuse focuses on that empowering them. So please do not take action without their consent. Ensure you ask them what they want throughout the entire process and keep checking in with them. And if somebody doesn't know what they want or they are feeling overwhelmed, consider giving them some options to make the choosing process easier. I don't know about you, I can't make a decision for the life of me. So if somebody turned around and went, what do you want me to do? I might not have an answer. If somebody turns around and goes, hey, we can get somebody to come in and look through your social media accounts with you to help you be as protected as you can be, or we can offer you some sessions of counseling to talk through how this has been impacting you that would help me to decide. So consider what you can offer and how you present it to them. I am finishing up now. Um, I do have some questions in the chat, but as I am finishing up, I would really like to check in on how you are feeling now at the end of the session. It is a whirlwind session. Uh, to give you an example, we usually do things like this in about three hours. Um, so I really hope this brief introduction was useful, but please do share. Thank you very much. I'm going to leave that up for just a minute. Um, there are some really excellent questions here that I will get to. I think that's almost everybody, actually. Excellent. We've seen some change. That is fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody. And 
one thing is that sort of at the end of a session, we give a lot of information and sometimes people can go away and not really know what to do. So I'd really like you to take a moment to think about what is one, hit the microphone, what is one thing you are going to do for yourselves or others as a result of this training? If there is only one thing you do after this session, what is it going to be? Please share it in Mentimeter um, and we can have a look at what that is. Looking at the support we offer to employees before we ask them to gauge online, absolutely. Share the training and signpost glitch, thank you. Update our RNS support articles to include a specific online abuse section, perfect. An online abuse support article. If you do need support with any of that, please do reach out. I've got um, little leaflets I can give you for ways to contact me. Work with the engagement team on their online abuse strategy. Checking in on what explicit support is available already and check the websites to see if students can access guidance for online abuse without asking for it. Absolutely fantastic. I think there's one more at the bottom. Oh, a few more at the bottom. Reaching out to our comms team to let them know we understand they might be impacted to see and to see what offer we can support. Excellent. And again, reviewing that guidance and signposting. Thank you very much, everybody. That's just, it's really lovely to kind of see key actions that you will take away. So as I'm finishing up, I just wanted to let you know that we do have plenty of free resources on our website. It's literally glitchcharity.co.uk. I've also got leaflets I can give to you to access those. Um, we will also, we share an evaluation form. Um, please do share that out. I might ask if uh, Culture Shift can help to share that out at the end of the session. Um, the reason we do this is we are grant funded and it really helps us to show the impact of our work by having this data. So please do take the time to fill out a feedback form. Um, our calls to action at the moment are to sign up to our newsletter. The online safety bill is currently just about going through Parliament. Um, it has been some work and uh, signing up to our newsletter helps to keep you updated on that and on the regulations that are going to be coming in. And also, do get in touch to book a workshop with Glitch. We offer in-house sort of workshops for organizations looking to support their staff and uh, community. Uh, we have a whole suite of options that we offer, so please do come and chat to me if you'd like to learn more about that. Um, also contact our email address uh, info at Glitch Charity to do that. And then very finally, thank you very, very much for listening um, and thank you so much. I'm going to put some of the questions up because I deliberately left quite a lot of time for questions. Um, please do keep asking them uh, as I'm doing this, although there are already six, I might not get through more than that. But yeah, just to say thank you. And let's see. Uh, so we've got one which is how do we contribute our data and findings to your meetings on social media safety councils to contribute to wider change? That is amazing. Uh, we would love that kind of stuff. It's something that we do not have a lot of uh, data at the moment. So if you would like to get in touch with me about that, come up to me at the end and I can talk to you about how to facilitate that. Um, our next question is, can you give advice on how to get corporate comms on board with a supportive institu institutional approach to online abuse? Our corporate comms will often say no to respond as it inflames the situation. And this is a really tricky one, and this is where there needs to be a lot of conversations with your teams with, with different uh, priorities and sort of conversations that involve a lot of listening and understanding each other. I think the one thing that we would say is that depending on institutions, the response will differ. But um, this is where we say, like, when you respond to online abuse in a public statement, you are not tagging the person. You are not, like, posting the actual incident of online abuse. You are merely posting a statement of solidarity going, there is like online abuse is being experienced at the moment by our staff, by our students. This isn't acceptable. And just to highlight that you are aware of it, that you are doing something about it. And so the staff member feels supported. Um, it can be a really tricky one to get the balance right. So do talk to your comms team about how best to do it. Um, and yeah, try and have those conversations in-house as much as possible. Uh, what I would say is kind of by staying silent, you are, what's the word? Complicit, thank you. I am losing all of my words today. Yeah, there is a kind of a complicity in it. 
an institution has power to create that change, and that's why publishing st public statements is really important. Our next one is we've tried to approach the police as an institution about online abuse on behalf of staff, but they've told us people have to make individual reports. Yes, and this is where you can support the person to make that individual report and act as like a guide to how they do it most effectively, ways that you can step in to help them um, and kind of sort of helping them through that decision making and maybe giving your own contact as a way to be in contact with the police as well. It is quite difficult to deal with online abuse at an institutional level at the moment. Uh, a lot of systems aren't really set up for it properly. So it's about offering support where you can um, and even sort of writing, sorry, writing out the report as much as possible for the person experiencing the abuse. Uh, it's higher educational institutions can shy away from supporting those when the platform the abuse is happening on isn't owned by the, the institution. Any useful tips to help on this? And I think this is where, um, even if it, a platform isn't owned, like if an account isn't owned by the institution itself, the people managing that account are still part of your community. They are still your service users, be that uh, employees, be that students, be that um, sort of educational staff. And it really comes down to the well-being of your staff. And if even if the platform isn't owned by the institution, for example, if it's uh, a, a educator's personal Twitter account, then if they are being encouraged to post their research and being encouraged to post their initiatives by their institution, even though it's not an institution's account, there is still a responsibility there. Um, so I think phrasing it in terms of staff well-being, phrasing it in terms of staff safety um, or student safety, and phrasing it in terms of, you know, if you are doing diversity and inclusion work, this falls under it as well. Uh, do you offer short courses for students who have experienced anonymous online abuse? Sorry, didn't show that one. Uh, no, we don't at the moment, uh, but that would be something I'd be really interested in developing. So if anybody would like to come and talk to me about that, that would be really helpful. Um, we are looking to do some workshops in the summer with new student union officers coming in. So um, if you do want to talk to me about that, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, and do you offer short courses for perpetrators? Again, currently not. Glitch is an extremely tiny team. Um, when I first started, we were four or five people, and now we're eight. Um, so it's something that we are working towards. We do want to see this kind of public health approach to online abuse, where we are not just talking to victims. We are also talking to perpetrators. Um, so it is in the future, we hope. Sorry, short question. Uh, any difference in approach where the abuse takes the form of malicious allegations where you don't initially know they are malicious? So potentially about conduct as well as support. This can be a really tricky situation. And what I would say is any allegations that do come, you do have to treat as truthful until you find out they are not. Um, when things take the form of malicious allegations that uh, which are untrue and cause reputational harm, that is where you can start to take legal action on defamation. And I would highly consider uh, consulting the legal teams in your institutions and organizations if possible. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend sort of not treating allegations as uh, malicious when they first come in if you do not know, um, because we do not want to start questioning survivors. <coughs> Um, any other questions in the room? Oh, nice and silent, thank you. <laughs> um, then I will just say uh, thank you very much, everybody, for listening, engaging, participating uh, in the session today. Uh, I've really valued all of your time, and I hope that you have found this session valuable. I will be around, as, as I said, at the end of the session, I'll be around in the break and I'll be around sort of for the rest of the day. If you do want to come and talk to me about anything that has come up, please do. I've also got um, some leaflets on me uh, if you do want to get in touch with Glitch. And thank you very much. Incredible. I always go to speak without the microphone because I think I'm loud enough, but I don't think I actually am. Um, thank you all for joining that session. Thank you to Gwen for leading it. As Gwen mentioned, there's a menu 
um, on uh, the Glitch Charity website, which we'll share as part of the follow-up resources where you can see the sessions that they do offer. Um, but I think something that came out of that was share amongst the community as well, share amongst the other people that are in the room and um, other users of uh, Report and Support so that you can see the, um, uh, the kind of policies that exist at the moment and kind of learn from those. Um, as we always say, the great thing about there being so many partners um, kind of within the community of report and support users is that you might think that you have to start from scratch to do something, but the chances are it exists somewhere. So yeah, talk to each other as well. Um, we have a little bit of time before the next ses session starts. Um, so I will leave everyone to grab drinks. I think the teas and coffees might have been refilled over there and yeah. I'll give you some time before we start up again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. I hope you've had an amazing day so far and have been engaged in some great conversations and topics that have really sparked um, ideas and innovations for how you are going to, what you're going to do moving forward and take back to your institutions and organisations with you. For our closing session today, we're talking about removing the barriers to reporting, something I hope we can all agree is massively important and motivating for everyone in this room. Um, we're going to be focusing on removing those barriers, and our panel will, fo will cover topics such as the fear of retaliation and victimisation, worries about not being believed and taken seriously enough, and where to turn to um, when things go wrong as well. Um, we've got an amazing panel today with Sunday Blake from Wonky, Vicky Bars from Culture Shift, Kelly Prince from the 1752 Group, and Danny, Br Danny Bradford from UCL, L the UCL SU. So thank you all. Um, to kick things off, could we do quick introductions and opening statements from each of you? Uh, Vicky, if we'll start with you. Sure, um, I'm going to do this sitting down, that's okay, I've done a lot of standing up today. Um, so yeah, Vicky Bars, uh, pronouns are she, they, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about where my career began and um, some of the things I feel passionate about in relation to this. So I started my career in the student movement, I was the NUS LGBT officer back in 2010, which is the same year that the women's campaign undertook their hidden marks research. This research gets, research gets talked about a lot. Um, it, often quotes the one in 10 women student survey respondents experience serious physical or sexual assault in their time as a student. But a less talked about figure from that report is that only 2% of students who had been experiencing less serious sexual assault are likely to report to either the police or their institution. Now the research defined less serious sexual assaults as unwanted sexual contact, such as touching or molesting, including through clothes or unwanted kissing. Um, that made up the majority of reports um, in the Hidden Marks research, so 66% to be specific. Now many of us know sexual violence exists on a continuum where the most common experiences happen regularly, such as personal um, invasions of personal space, unwanted touch, sexual harassment, um, and such as those that you know we classify as less serious. They happen more frequently, but they happen more commonly. Um, yet those who experience them don't choose to report them, often because they don't think they're serious enough. Now, I think that's an issue, and I guess it, it interests me in the relation to this topic because um, there are you know, concerns around underreporting. Um, and in, in terms of having been around since the inception of that research and seeing you know, swathes of other pieces of research, prevalence surveys and um, national guidance being produced, um, you know, there's a lot of, of things that have happened in the last decade. Um, and I see similar with other issues as well. So understanding, for example, having been a, a quality diversity and pra inclusion practitioner for a long time and having administered report and support at a couple of different universities, um, I think you know, the prevalence of those who experience these sorts of harms um, compared to those who report is, is drastically underreported. Hate crimes against trans people have increased dramatically in recent years, um, and it's no coincidence that this has coincided with the rise in hostility towards trans people um, within our current government and many of the organisations that we work in across all sectors, but especially in universities. Stop Hate UK reported that in 2020 21, 2,630 hate crimes against transgender people were reported to the police, a 16% increase. However, we still know that that number is drastically underreported. 
So we're talking about um, a comparison to a national LGBT survey that was done with over 100,000 people, where 88% of transgender people said that they wouldn't have reported the most serious incident types. And on all of this, um, universities, as bastions of free speech, have a careful tightrope to walk in terms of making sure that those who are expressing their free speech don't veer into where the very blurred boundaries are around breaking the law in terms of freedom of expression. Um, the HRC guidance states really clearly that some speech can be limited if it breaks criminal law. However, who adjudicates this and how um, is going to change um, with the Freedom of Speech Bill that's going through Parliament at the moment, or Lords at the moment, I should say. Literally right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Sunday's going to say some more about it too. Um, and we expect that to see that impact on how people feel about what they're experiencing, the judgments on it, and whether or not they're going to want to report. Um, misogyny isn't recorded as a hate crime, um, and trans misogyny um, has recently been deemed acceptable in a number of employment tribunals. Um, so who gets to decide what is and what isn't acceptable is often up for debate still. Um, don't think it should be, but that's the world we're in right now. Um, so as well as some of the like large scale political issues that people are experiencing, there's obviously the things that are slightly closer to home in terms of, and I think we've touched on this a little bit today already, but fear of retaliation. Um, that you might be accused of making vexatious complaints. This is probably one of the most common things that someone asks you when you're setting up a report and support system. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, people feeling that they can't prove what's happened to them. Um, and so this really does lead to a lot of people choosing not to report or reporting anonymously. And it's great we have an anonymous reporting option, but that's a means to an end for us. It's not the end goal of what we do. It's because we know so many people fear reporting with their own contact details um, because of all of these various barriers. So yeah, that's me. Um, I'm going to pass. Yeah. Sure, uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is Sunday Blake. I'm an associate editor at Wonky. Um, I think before I talk about the actual difficulties and barriers that students face through the official complaint processes, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, unofficial disclosures. Um, so we know that students will disclose to the people that they feel safe, safest with. Um, and as a student union president um, a few years ago, I was repeatedly disclosed to uh, from students in the community because I was very loud, very vocal about sexual misconduct. Um, and often I would get sort of um, chastised for this by members of my union, members of staff who are saying, why are they disclosing for you? It's your fault for making them think that. There's official disclosure stuff. Um, and I also knew of cases at different student unions where students will disclose to someone at the reception or they will disclose to someone in the canteen because suddenly they feel safe enough in which to tell someone. And they will be told, come back on Monday when the right person is in the office for you to disclose to. And often the students will never go back. Um, because in that moment of sort of bravery and courage, they are shot down and they can't muster up that courage again. Um, or they just can't face having to explain it again and again and again and again to multiple members of staff. And universities are massive institutions. Um, I've worked in them, and even after years, I am still confused as to who to go to for some issues. We cannot expect a student who is traumatized to sit with a staff directory <laughs> and work out who to go to, and then approach this stranger with all of their trauma um, and, and feel that that's an appropriate response. We need to properly, uh, so basically, yes, yeah, siloing complaints to the right person is not a institution-wide anti-sexual violence strategy. Um, it is everyone's issue, and we need to properly train all staffs and student volunteers in disclosures and quickly getting the student the right support. And the reason I mention student volunteers is because oftentimes students will also uh, disclose to student society committee members. Um, and the response from their peers often ostracization will impact whether they then feel comfortable approaching the institution because if they're not believed by their peers why are they not going to be believed by their institute why are they going to be believed by the institution um then students must raise the complaint through their internal procedures um and as we've covered today obviously this ranges from simple web pages all the way up through to wordy documents uh, deep in the back pages of an institution's website and whether or not students then get representation, representative support from their student union is also inconsistent. Uh, and that's because some universities have policies that can obstruct student officers from supporting students directly, such as needing them to be on an impartial panel uh, members in deciding the outcome of a complaint. 
Um, and this is a massive issue. So as someone who was incredibly vocal against sexual violence, um, went to university later in life, uh, worked for Women's Aid before I went to university, um, I was not allowed to sit on any sexual misconduct complaint because I uh, had a vested interest and that would not make me partial. So it isolates the victim. Um, and when we are looking for impartiality, or institutions are, we are essentially removing women and feminists and people who actually understand the nuances and prevalences of sexual violence. And that's a massive problem. Um, I've been in uh, meetings with student union officers who said that they're looking for student representation on the panel. They've said, can anyone who's been victim of sexual assault put your hand up? Can anyone who's been involved in an anti-sexual violence campaign put your hand up? okay, none of you can sit on the panel. So this is like a massive issue because the representatives that then do sit on the panel are sometimes completely uh, unfamiliar with the nuances and issues around sexual violence. Um, and really these are issues that need experts. Um, and free, it means that they're not advising their rights. So the students who know how to work systems, know how complaints work, have an in-depth knowledge of their rights, so the law, institutions can navigate procedures, we know from previous presentations today that perpetrators of sexual violence in institutions are, tend to be white men, obviously not all of them, but that tends to be the group that is perpetrating uh, these acts. And they also tend to be the ones who know how to work through institutional pr uh, procedures. So when we have these overly complex bureaucratic roles, we are privileging the students who are comfortable and uh, competent in that environment. Um, school leaver students as well, so students who've gone to university at 18 may need help to realise that they can challenge their institution, um, and that's very important if the complaint is against a member of staff. Um, and obviously cultural barriers can be an issue here too. And also it might not be in the institution's best interest to inform students of their rights. Um, now, if students are informed and aware, obviously there are other things involved, so time and energy. This is a massive impact for disabled students, for parent students, for students in part-time work. Note that during a cost of living crisis, this will go up. Um, and the time scale for complaint procedures. Now, I don't have data for all the institutions on their time scales. If anyone in this room has the time and energy to do FOIs, I would really appreciate that. Um, but the highest percent of complaints closed by the OIA within six months, so that's once they've gone through their institution and now they've gone through the appeal and then they've gone to the OIA, is six months. So that's the, most, the highest percentage they've managed to close within six months. Other years are a lot lower. So if we're looking at the student life cycle, these students are leaving before their complaints are resolved. Um, they are going through their assessments, they're going through their dissertations, all while an active investigation is going on, um, which is not great from a wellbeing point of view, from a pedagogical point of view. Um, they may have had several staff members uh, supporting them because of the uh, quick overturn of staff in student unions. Um, and yeah, they might have graduated before the uh, complaint is uh, resolved. The perpetrator might have graduated before the complaint is uh, resolved. Um, right, I'm just going to skip this quickly because I've written lots and I'm talking loads. Ah, yes. So, um, actually, I'm not going to patronise you if about the Zelic model, but obviously um, the Zelic principles is something that was repealed and is still... Uh, so on large, the Zelic principle has been repealed, and that's thanks to um, things like Hidden Marks coming out 10 years ago, but the ideas behind it are still in, uh, in motion in universities. And again, this is because of the very kind of disparate, um, disparate nature of disclosures. A lot of students, whether or not their investigation gets, inve their complaint gets investigated properly, it rests on luck. So it rests on, are they disclosing to someone who understands the legal obligation of the university or like someone who understands the nuances around sexual violence? Um, in particular, this is really important for Gen Z because Gen Z are amazing. Um, their understanding of things like consent is so nuanced and it's so fast evolving. I was, I was on TikTok a few weeks ago and there was this whole discussion around if you're sleeping with someone without contraception and they're telling you that they're not sleeping with anyone else, that's technically not consent, because you're not, you're not consenting to sleep with someone who's sleeping with lots of people 
in terms of like a sexual health point of view. And I was like, wow, these kids are really like looking into this. Um, and as Graham mentioned in one of the breakout rooms, there are vast generational differences uh, between the people sitting on disciplinary panels and their understanding of consent and what students understand what consent is. And even if something isn't against the law, it doesn't mean that that student doesn't feel that they've had their consent like violated. And that's really important because when we look at something like the Zelic principles, which is basically, we're not going to investigate this, it's got to go to the police. What we're saying to the, I think it's institution misogyny when they do that, because what we're saying to that student is, you need to prove this beyond reasonable doubt. You have to prove this to the fallible legal system. But when a student commits a, technically a crime, like an, a graffiti, an act of graffiti, or you know, two rugby lads are in a brawl in the student bar and one assaults another, technically a crime, we're not referring them to the legal system. We're saying, you can come to the university and we will do it on the balance of probability. We will look at this on the balance of probability, but sexual misconduct, which impacts women more, that has to be proven beyond reasonable doubt. So it's holding uh, an act that, in, that impacts women students more than anyone else to a much higher evidence and standard of proof. So, um, yeah, that's what. That's why I call it institutional um, misogyny. I have a lot more to say, but this has taken me longer than I thought to get through. So I'm going to hand the microphone over, and then I can uh, answer any questions that have come up. So, uh, thank you. Uh, very hard acts to follow. Um, I'm Danny Bradford. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today. So thank you so much to the um, entire Culture Shift team. I'm always so honoured when when I get to speak um, for your team. Um, so I'm currently Policy and Research Manager at Students' Union UCL. Um, there I run our Active Bystander Programme, which is the biggest in the country um, at a UK university. Um, it's been going on for seven years. It started out as a um, consent programme and has evolved to cover all forms of unacceptable behaviour um, that students might experience in their time as students. Um, and we've trained over 35,000 students. And this program is really looking at making sure students have the skills and confidence to first of all recognize inappropriate behavior um, in other people and in themselves. And then when they experience something inappropriate or unacceptable or illegal, how can they intervene safely um, to keep both themselves and, and the victim safe um, in that situation? Um, within my time working in student unions, um, I've also carried out uh, various research projects into the experience of harassment um, of students of colour. So my, my background is in um, research uh, and I'm an independent researcher and within that role I focus on um, harassment and sexual misconduct within the context of academic fieldwork particularly and, and archaeological fieldwork particularly. Um, and prevention methods, so uh, what factors within fieldwork make harassment and sexual mis misconduct so common in those settings, and it is really common, it's between 60 to 70% um, of all participants, depending on which study you're looking at, will experience harassment um, within academic fieldwork. Um, so what makes it so common in these settings, and then how can we use that data to inform prevention methods? Um, and I think that has a lot of um, kind of overlap with other situations students might be in, uh, like study abroad, for example, or placements. Um, myself, personally, I also experienced and reported staff-student sexual misconduct when I was at university, and I went through um, uh, the dis disciplinary process at my university, um, which was, frankly... Um, extremely traumatizing and informs the, the work that I do today. Um, and speaking about balance of probabilities, when I was at university, the balance of probabilities was the criminal uh, standard of beyond reasonable doubt. So when I'm talking about the various different uh, kind of barriers to reporting that students might face, I'm kind of drawing on my experience as a trainer and facilitator within the active bystander program that I lead now. Um, and I'm drawing on my experience um, of carrying out student experience research and um, academic research as well, and I'm also drawing on my own lived experiences. Uh, there are many different barriers to reporting, and I'm, I'm sure you will all be aware of, of uh, kind of various different barriers that our students and staff face into reporting um, things that they experience. And I could go into loads of detail about all different ones, and I'm sure we'll cover many of them in, in the questions portion of the panel. But there's one that I'd like to highlight today, which in my opinion is if not the most important, it's the first one you need to tackle. So it's the one where if you don't have this down, it doesn't matter if everyone knows where your reporting system is and how to use it. It doesn't matter if they feel confident that if they report, you'll treat it seriously. Um, none of that matters if students or anyone who is a victim survivor doesn't actually recognize what they've experienced. 
Um, so there are kind of immense barriers, and there's been a lot of academic research on this as well, um, for people being able to recognize, name, and take ownership of one's own experience, um, and what kind of societal and political factors stops us from being able to do so. So really the first hurdle that someone has to overcome in order to be able to report their experience is to recognize it, and to recognize it as behavior that's unacceptable and worthy of reporting. Um, so we all know that growing kind of grassroots movements over the last few decades has sought to empower marginalized voices to call out their experiences, to recognize their experiences for what they are, such as the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, and to avoid normali normalizing experiences of oppression and of abuse. Um, however, many students can still not overcome that first hurdle. So there's just some data around this in a HEPI um, study that came out uh, a few years ago looking at students pre-university, 30% uh, of students were not confident in knowing what constitutes the sexual harassment. Uh, in research I carried out at Hertfordshire Students' Union investigating the experience of students of colour, um, I found that 7% of students of colour that we surveyed agreed that they'd experienced ha harassment whilst at university, but when they were presented with a list of scenarios that fall under the legal definition of either harassment, assault or rape, um, this actually rose to 23% um, identified as having experienced one of those specific scenarios. Um, when I was carrying out research into um, archaeological field work, um, some of the open box comment responses um, that I got, so in the survey it had, again, a list of scenarios that fall under the, these legal definitions, and, and a lovely comment I got back was, these are just normal parts of archaeological field work, and if you can't deal with it, then you shouldn't sorry, um, do archaeological field work, so I'm sure you can imagine why I decided not to pursue that line of work. Um, and one of the most common complaints in feedback forms that we receive from students completing our active bystander program is that they do not feel some of the scenario examples we give um, to illustrate different kinds of harassment and discrimination really count, particularly when we're using scenarios about racist microaggressions. There's a lot of comments of like, that is not harassment, that's not discrimination. There's a growing socio-political pressure to curtail the rights of marginalized communities to be able to define and name their own experiences of harassment and violence. Whilst UUK published research showing that staff and students regularly experience microaggressions, Cambridge University was described as fostering an environment akin to that of a police state for encouraging students to report microaggressions through their um, culture shift report and support system. Whilst we are urged to learn to have grown up debates about gender identity and gender fluidity, trans students and staff are some of the most vulnerable in our communities and are consistently gaslighted out of naming their experiences. Peaceful protesters, um, claim that they just want to have a conversation but conveniently ignore that they're part of an increasingly hostile and unlivable culture for many trans people in the UK who are harassed in the streets, harassed in universities, in workplaces and denied gender affirming and often life-saving medical care. Two in five trans people have had to deal with, ha with a hate crime or hate incident in the last 12 months. Many trans people are forced to hide who they are, change how they dress or drop out of university because of fear of discrimination. In our workplaces, half of trans and non-binary people have hidden um, or disguised that they are LGBT for this reason, and one in eight have been physically attacked by a colleague or customer. From my own research into academic fieldwork, 100% of non-binary responses, respondents had experienced sexual misconduct on their most recent fieldwork experience, so not even in their lifetime of doing fieldwork, but in their most recent fieldwork experience. We cannot remove barriers to reporting without actively fighting against this growing issue. So before we can speak about the specific barriers about reporting um, that surround even knowing how to report or feeling confident enough to re report, we need to confront the barriers that prevent our students and staff from even recognizing their experiences as unacceptable, let alone naming and reporting them. We need to push back and protect the rights of the most marginalized in our com communities to define and assert their own experiences. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Kelly Prince. I'm currently working with the 1752 group. Um, also very grateful to be here today on such an amazing panel as well. Um, still trying to process everything that um, everyone else has said. Uh, lots of food for thought. Um, so my background is I've been working in and around gender-based violence for about 20 years. I've worked uh, in research, I've worked in frontline domestic violence provision, and for the last five years, I've been working um, in anti-sexual misconduct work at universities. So in, in my last role, I was 
uh, responsible for policy, staff training, uh, student campaigns and investigations, um, which was a lot. And if anyone else has a job that has all of those things in it, please come and cry with me because it was a lot. <laughs> and if you're thinking of setting up a role, please don't do that. <laughs> um, so in terms of uh, reporting, I'm thinking um, uh, of my experience as an investigator and uh, the, the barriers to reporting that I experienced. And I think on a um, broad brush level, generally speaking, um, our processes, our responses in this particular area in terms of accountability structures are really just um, poor and are having, are harming people. Um, we are recreating all of the failures of the criminal justice system and we don't need to, there, there are different things, we could be doing things differently and we need to be thinking creatively about how we do that. Um, so that's, I think, um, a big a, a barrier is that actually reporting isn't always, or in fact is rarely a, a safe thing to do. It requires you um, to put uh, a lot of yourself on the line. It's a big personal risk, it's a big social risk, it's a big educational risk. There is There are huge burdens attached to, the, to making a report and going through an investigation process. Um, they are administrative, they are social um, and uh, emotional, uh, you, you know, students may be trying to do this while also dealing with a large amount of trauma um, and completing assignments and continuing with, the, with their education and often um, in the vast majority of cases uh, the reporting student knew the responding student before and they have shared circles of friendship groups and so there are huge implications for them in terms of of, of their social uh, networks and especially if they um, are relatively uh, new to higher education, you know, of their first years and they're uh, trying to find um, a new support network, it can be hugely impactful. So I think we need to be looking at our processes and making them safer and um, building confidence in our students as well. So we need to be making sure our senior leaders are prioritising this issue. Uh, so I've seen some research recently about um, the cost per student of mental health support being around about 50 pounds, and the cost per student of marketing is around two and a half thousand pounds. So we do have money, and we can choose to spend it in a different way. And so we need to be making sure that our senior leaders are prioritizing the issue, that they understand what the, the, the issues are, that they are informed by a variety of expert voices, including uh, local uh, partner organizations, but also um, people who are experts by experience, uh, people who are research subject experts as well. Um, we need to be promoting the fact that this is a priority issue for us. Uh, we need to be making it front and center. Uh, we need to be educating and training everyone staff, um, students. One of the problems uh, that, I, uh, that we had uh, a few times is in, in, in investigations is uh, we talk about the outcry witness who is the first person that um, a survivor might talk to. It's usually one of their friends and um, they usually have a, a really important statement to make and it's really valuable evidence for an investigation. Um, but some reporting parties will say, I told my friend Joe Bloggs, and they responded with rape myths, and they blamed me. They said I shouldn't have done this or that or the next thing. We had a massive row, and we haven't spoken since, so I really don't want you to contact them. And obviously, for a, you know, a disciplinary committee, they need to understand you know, this, why are there no outcry witnesses in, in, in this case. So if we're training up students to understand how to take 
or how to respond if they, if they receive a disclosure from one of their friends. Um, it's also a skill that they can take into the, um, into, it can be applied to lots of different scenarios actually and can be taken into the uh, work environment. So there, there are lots of benefits um, in terms of uh, how we can engage students in, in this. Um, and, and we also need to be uh, upskilling uh, our staff in terms of um, how to respond appropriately to a disclosure because it's incredibly easy to get it wrong and that can have a, um, a massive impact on um, how that person then goes on to not only uh, decide whether they want to make a report but also access support and even how they think about their own experience. Um, so train everybody from from your governing bodies um, to through, th across your university as many people as possible. I think we should be talking about um, uh, mandatory training. You know, if 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 I need to take part in data protection training, then you know, I, I probably there's a good argument to be made that I should also have a good understanding of how to respond if someone's uh, made a disclosure of, of sexual violence or misconduct. Um, and then on a, on a kind of societal level, I think one of the challenges that I had uh, as an investigator is that um, rape myths and victim blaming, particularly the idea that false allegations are really common, is everywhere. It is embedded in our society and even people who have had training and um, are, uh, would think of themselves as quite progressive, um, you, you can hear when they talk to you um, and when they sit on discipline panels um, that, that's, that they, they too have been affected by um, rape myths. They are pervasive, they are everywhere um, and we need to be dismantling the idea that false allegations are common. Um, we have a lot of science that shows that it's not. Um, so if I need to take a bundle of 27 reports, research reports, peer review, reviewed data and research to an, uh, a training session to show people you know, maybe you want to have a look at this one or this one or this one or this one. Um, then that's you know that's something that I'm I'm prepared to do because it's incredibly problematic, and I'll pass back now. <laughs> Sorry, um, maybe do you want to that and use the other mic? We'll use this one. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for those opening statements. There's a lot of information there to take in. I think one thing we can all agree on is the the mountain of barriers that there are to reporting. And I think that's really stood out to me is it's not as simple as just listing them. There's so much interconnectedness and so much nuance in all of those barriers that we need these open discussions to understand how to take it on from a systemic um, perspective and how to work across organizations and regulatory bodies and student activist groups to understand the problem and address it um, cohesively. Um, <clears throat> and so, I think without a doubt there's wider political debates that have an impact on how people report and the confidence that people have in reporting. Should institutions be expected to counter the noise of what's going on in society and in those political discussions? And if so, how do you think we should do it? Um, who would like to pick that up first? Sorry, what, what do you mean by noise? Um, protests, news, bills, passing through commons. Um, the kind of the the background noise when you're experiencing reporting. I'm happy to start. I think um, the, the easy answer is yes. I think I think there is um, particularly, you know, with this um, OFS uh, statement of expectations and potentially regulating prevention and response to harassment. I think there absolutely is a duty of universities to be countering this noise and to be very. 
I, I think that there's a process that institutions need to go on. Too many institutions are still not clear within themselves about what their values are, what their boundaries are, um, and what types of behaviour they're tackling, and what constitutes that type of behaviour, first of all. So how can we expect students to understand that um, as well? Um, so I think there's kind of a journey where institutions really need to regroup at this point and think, okay, what? let's go back to the, the start and be really clear and really specific about what we're trying to tackle and what we won't accept in our community. And students need to know that. So too often we bring students into universities from a wide range of different backgrounds, different countries, uh, different family relations, different cultures, and we expect them to all know that there's some type of student code of conduct. But we very rarely talk to them about it, we very rarely explain it to them, we very rarely have places for them to ask questions, you know, at best sometimes it's an online form they sign at the bottom but they probably scroll to the bottom and don't read it fully and there's nowhere for them to actually engage in a productive conversation about what that means for them as a student and how they act. Um, so I think there, there, there needs to be kind of deliberate outreach um, to students, there needs to be kind of open conversations and I think things like active bystander programs um, can be really positive um, in, in helping kind of achieve that change. I mean we've been really lucky um, at, at the Student Union at UCL, um, UCL University very very kindly funds the project and we match fund the, the money that they give us um, and it's a core part of students induction so it's as close to compulsory as UCL gets really for their induction um, things and um, that is really a space to come together and think what are our boundaries as a student community, what will we accept, um, how do we spot um, unacceptable behaviour and then what can we do about it um, and how can we build more safe, kind, inclusive communities. Um, so yeah, I would say when we're thinking about institutions putting resource behind these things, something like um, an active bystander programme or similar can be really positive and I would also say it's always great if it can be run by a student's union because students will have more open conversations with staff members outside of the university um, than they necessarily will if they think it's like connected to their course or their department or if they share something or if they make a disclosure that's going to get back to you know the person who tutors them etc so it's nice to have that little bit of a removal but for it to be centered as a core part of the student induction um, and a core part of kind of um, being integrated into the student community. Um, I think so. two points on countering noise. I think the first part is that I consistently see a lack of bravery and like commitment from institutions when dealing with this kind of thing, when dealing with um, trans issue, transgender rights issues, when dealing with sexual misconduct, microaggressions. And what happens is that in the absence of strong institutional statements, uh, the press will target student union officers. And we see that over and over again when it's a 20-year-old, a 21-year-old being profiled in the Daily Mail because the union is running um, training on how to appropriately support student sex workers. And whenever an institution comes out and is bold against this, I'm like, oh, thank God, but it's just not happening enough at all, um, which is really frustrating, um, incredibly frustrating. Um, I think the second thing is, what. I mean, there's a whole debate in higher education around how much responsibility does HE have for correcting issues that are in wider society, for correcting issues that have come up in students' lives before they arrive at the institution. Now, institutions across the country widely use deficit models to uh, talk to disabled students, uh, students with learning difficulties, working class students, um, care leaver students. They will be acknowledged as a group who may struggle academically, may need some extra support, may need to come to a summer school before they go on to you know, <laughs> be part of the learning community, right? Now, a report came out in HEPI uh, in 2021, uh, which was uh, about sex and relationships, and it found that 60% um, of students were confident uh, on enrollment uh, in defining what constitutes sexual uh, consent. Now, what the report didn't do is break it down into demographic. When it was broken down into demographic, uh, privately educated men 
it was at about 20%. So if we are going to be, if we're going to be drawing circles around groups of students and targeting them and saying, this is how you behave in a middle class institution and this is how you use academic language, why are we not also saying, this is how you don't sexually assault someone? Um, I, I think that that's the obvious <laughs> answer, um, but we're not doing it. And I'm, I'm not saying that we should necessarily group people up into a room and target them because I know what will happen. We'll get lots of private educated men holding up signs saying this is not what a rapist looks like, of course. But what we do need is a wider conversation around this, and that needs to be happening on induction. People need to know what is sexual mis misconduct. I've had so many conversations, and, and that's also for the victims as well, by the way. It's not just the perpetrators. Um, I was heartbroken once uh, when I was speaking to a student who was really upset because she'd worn a club into a top, in a top into a club, <laughs> and someone had pulled it down and revealed her breasts to the whole club. And she didn't know why she was so upset because she didn't know, she didn't have the language to communicate that that was sexual assault. So this is so important that we, we don't just say to students, this is how you become the perfect Russell Group student. We say, this is how you treat people in a way that our community expects you to. Um, yeah. Uh, Kelly or Vicky, do you Where want to pick up? Where are we going? This okay. way? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's just given me a lot to think about. And uh, <laughs> you're totally right. And um, I guess I want to think about it maybe from um, a staff perspective as well. So what Danny was saying in terms of student induction is also lacking in workplace inductions as well. So like we we give people like this small amount of probably online training and I go, there you go, do your job in so many workplaces but certainly in universities that like my induction has never been longer than maybe an hour and a half where the the head of the university might pop along and be like, hello, I'm important, and then leave again. And, and it really doesn't give you the, the context around these values, which they probably spent thousands of pounds on a marketing campaign to produce. Um, and then they're not spending time with you to create the communities and, and the stuff that um, our colleagues were saying from Warwick about restorative justice. Like, There's preventative work that you can do in restorative justice that's about community building. And I think that like universities consider themselves to be the places where cultures are created in in the world um, and so they should be investing more time in the people who work and study there to actually have these conversations and be, learn what the values mean and get the skills that they need to be able to actually live those values so I think yeah it's totally echoed for staff as much as students. Great Kelly do you have anything that you'd like to add to that? Um, yeah noth nothing massive but um, I would say that yes, we 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 uh, need to, um, as institutions, be braver and, and bolder. And um, part of that is that you know that we counter this with an evidence base. And what sector is better positioned than education to provide an evidence base? So when people say you know this isn't happening, people aren't experiencing this level of harassment. Um, you know, we need decent prevalence data, and I'm really glad that the OFS has made some commitment towards that uh, following the uh, evaluation of the statement of expectations. Uh, we need an evidence base that moves beyond counting people who have experienced sexual misconduct at university, but looks at prevalence versus disclosure versus reporting versus outcomes, that looks at demographics, um, that looks at location and other contextual data. Um, if we don't have this, then how do we know that any of our interventions are effective? Um, we, we, need a, we need that baseline data, and we need an evidence base. Um, and we also need, we can look to like our colleagues uh, across the pond and um, down under, to use all those uh, <laughs> phrases. Um, Australia have got a really good evidence base. Scotland are doing amazing things. Big up to anyone who's, from, who's in from Scotland today. Um, some of these issues have, have been raised um, in the US and, and elsewhere in other contexts. And, I've, and you know, we're not learning from, from um, other jurisdictions in terms of how we could do things differently um, and we we need to be doing we need to, so so I was reading something the other day that was um, uh, by Cantalupo and uh, she was talking about the free speech issue 
and that the idea that students report staff members for sexual misconduct because they've said something uh, that they find offensive has become a settled assumption. She was saying that when we don't have evidence, then assumptions are allowed to settle regardless of, of how accurate they are. And when they did look at this data, they found that actually in the vast majority of cases where students had made reports about um, staff members there had been physical contact and in a large number of cases there had been behavior which would be categorized as, um, as criminal and unlawful in a criminal context. Uh, so they've, they've done some of this work for us. You know, we just, we need to um, get it out there and, and we need to be using it in our evidence base in terms of where we go forward and, and, and how we continue to work in this area. Amazing, thank you. I think the data point is really, really crucial and you spoke about it in your opening statement as well as having that evidence of what's going on and being able to show our progress in removing barriers as well. Um, I have loads of questions, but I'm conscious of times so I'm gonna open it out to the audience and see if we have any questions on Slido um, that we can go through. Thank you. Um, so the question is, um, how would you use, re oh no, sorry, wrong question. Um, the question is, a lot of staff want to do the good work and spend the time to engage, but are hindered by workloads they have and additional expectations. Um, do you have any advice on how to deal with that? I mean, I'd start with saying that these need, these should be specialist roles. Um, this, you know, there, there is a, there's a part that's like, it's everyone's responsibility to make a culture inclusive. But to make a culture inclusive uh, and, and everyone's role in it should not be so taxing that you can't balance it with your workload. So there's two issues there. Either your normal workload is kind of unmanageable and I hope, I hope you're part of a union um, <laughs> or um, the, proper, the, the proper work isn't being done by the people who it should be being done by so when we're talking about like everyone's role to be inclusive and, and create good cultures it's like the small everyday things that's just like being a good human um, and, and being nice to each other and looking out for each other in the same way that you treat a friend if like a student looks upset reaching out to them you know are you okay you're having a difficult day but there really does need to be resources for specialist staff members and I think we've seen institutions that have done this incredibly well and I would always point to Durham and um, Clarissa Humphreys and, and the team they have there, which is is um, just you know an amazing team that have made really really great progress within Durham and, and having real big impacts on students. I think when I was a student, uh, looking back now um, as someone that reported, I kind of thought there was like this big conspiracy um, and that universities maliciously um, kind of held down complainants and and we know that there's there's times when they do and there's times when kind of their concern about PR uh, runs a bit wild but now working in universities for a number of years I realized that the majority of people want to do good work and and there are a few issues there either they're not able to do good work because they're not resourced properly they're not able to do good work because they're burnt out because maybe they're a member of a marginalized community and all the EDI work gets put on them um, or maybe they're kind of constrained by bureaucracy that um, senior officials in the university are kind of reluctant to change. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of if you're a staff member who that's not your role to be work doing casework or within the EDI, et cetera, um, then it's about the small things that you can make, the differences that you can make in kind of the small acts that should be um, kind of reasonable to fit within your day. Um, and then if you are someone who's working within EDI and, and that is your specific role, if you're kind of struggling to get there or feeling like you can't manage it with your workload, it's an institutional funding issue normally, not having enough staff or having unreasonable workloads on the staff that they do have. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, is there anything anyone would like to add to that? No? Oh. Yeah, no, just um, as someone who has um, done these workloads quite a bit in universities, um, I think there's two things. And uh, I think Danny's right, um, specialist roles are really important, but balancing specialist roles with embedding across other roles as well um, and getting people to take responsibility, which I think can be 
largely about taking them on a journey of understanding. Um, and I had some really wonderful wins, especially when I was working at Goldsmiths, of seeing in the two and a half years I was there, people who were quite resistant at the beginning go on like training and be part of strategic conversations and help run, run campaigns. And then by the end of the time there, they. They were like talking about it in a way that they had no idea they could have done two years ago. And it just felt really wonderful to watch people go on that journey. And I'm sure anyone who's kind of responsible for project managing this work has watched people do that in their own universities too. So just like have confidence that you can, yeah, bring people along with you, um, but know where generalist um, upskilling for everyone has a place and where a specialist resource needs to be invested in by the organization. Yeah, I completely agree with what's been said. I also think um, in terms of burnout in particular, it's understanding who your allies are and who friendly voices are within an organisation who can help have your back and support when things do get really, really tough as well. And I think self that self-care elements come up quite a lot today. Um, in this work, we know it's difficult and we know there's a lot of challenges. And I think self-care in whatever form it takes for individuals is really important to highlight. Um, one of the other questions we've had in is probably more specific to culture shift, um, but it's, can we pull data from everyone's report and support analytics to understand the most prevalent reasons for anonymous reporting and create our own data sets? Um, so one of the things that Vicky is working on with um, culture shift at the moment is um, putting together anonymous data from our partners. So expect to have some contract um, amendments through to understand how to opt into that and to pull out some of these data sets. Vicky, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. So um, you should be hearing from your relationship managers in the very near future um, about uh, a, a slight change to your contracts with um, Culture Shift in terms of allowing us to analyze data sets. Um, we already can access that information, but we don't currently have agreements with partners around how we would analyze it. So there's just a slight variation that we're sending out um, around that. We will give you loads more information, but it means that we can do more data comparison. And yeah, one of the things we can't look at currently is the reasons people select for um, reporting anonymously and being able to compare that cross institutionally. Um, so some of you who have published it publicly can see the other people who's published it publicly, but the majority of people aren't publishing this publicly yet um, for many different reasons. Um, happy to talk about that till the cows come home, um, but won't take up the rest of the session doing that. Um, uh, but yeah, so it means we'll be able to like provide big national data sets for you to use in comparison with data that's within your um, report. We're doing that in an aggregate way, so we won't actually see individualized report information and it will all be computerized and we've got like a really good set of FAQs if this has suddenly made you have loads of questions. Um, and sorry, Rebecca and Sarah, if you get loads of questions as a result of this. Um, but yes, it's coming very soon and we're really excited about it. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that I had as well was around uh, the OFS statement of expectations that we've mentioned a couple of times. Um, what do you think the relationship is between regular regulatory bodies and institutions to take on this work together? And how should we work together with regulatory bodies to make sure that the insights that come out of those are, are implemented and worked on? Uh, Kelly, do you want to go first on this? Um, yeah, I kind of... Um, I'm a little, bit, a little bit frustrated with the OFS because... Um, the statement of expectations didn't go far enough, and I think that it was reasonably clear at that point that it didn't go far enough. And I think that regulators should regulate. Um, I think that we need to have uh, uh, conditions around um, harassment and, and sexual misconduct um, that are part of our conditions of registration. Um, because at the moment, we've got um, institutions have, have a million different issues that they have to deal with and so that means that provision and um, knowledge and expertise is really patchwork across the country. It may even fall on the, on the shoulders of one or two people in an institution um, and as we mentioned earlier um, that that can lead to burnout or people leave and suddenly um, the work stalls or um, we're not getting the progress that we need. So I think um, 
you know, there's always been the argument, well, each individual institution is autonomous and different, and and that's true, but surely at this point, you know, what are we, seven, eight years on, um, from, you know, six, wait, my maths is bad, uh, six years on from the Change the Culture Report, you know, I think we can be agreeing that there are some minimum standards in terms of work and provision in this area that every institution, regardless of its size, um, should be meeting and should be delivering because it's about creating safe in, um, education environments. It's about enabling people um, to access their education um, and their student experience. Um, and if you haven't got that, then what have we got? Uh, so yeah, I think uh, regulators should regulate. And, and, and at the same time, I think that institutions, you know, as a sector, we are well placed to be creative and to try things. You know, not everything's going to work, and it's okay, you know, that to try new things um, and risk them failing because you know what, you know, they might work, and they might actually improve what we've got at the moment. Um, and if we don't take, if we don't try, if we don't, if we're not creative about um, different um, evidence-based options, but trying new things. Um, then we're stuck with the status quo, and that's just not really working for anyone. It's not working, you know, but a lot of um, investigators I've spoken to, so it's not just my experience, but at the end of an investigation, regardless of the outcome, there is absolutely no one in that room that is happy or thinks that it was a good thing, you know, a process, that it was um, fair and balanced and no one is benefiting from what we've got at the moment and it's and um it's certainly not acting as any kind of uh deterrent so um so going back to the original point th there's definitely space for um individual institutions to try new things but also to learn from each other's mistakes i think we could do that a lot better um and to work alongside regulators regulators at the need to be informed by practitioners, by survivors, by academics who have got a lot of research, a lot of knowledge in this area, um, local partners, the let's get all of the expertise and inform what happens next. If they're, they're gonna do a prevalence survey, so let's get the methodological expertise as well as all the input from all of those other stakeholders that I mentioned as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's. Great, thank you. Would anyone like to add to that? Um, I'll just say a couple of things quickly. I completely agree. I think um, there is a drastic need for um, regulatory intervention um, and stronger regulatory intervention as well. I do personally feel that um, the statement of expectations is ha has not gone far enough. Um, and, and there does need to be kind of regulatory work done around this because institutions won't solve this on their own. First of all, there's kind of two things there. Some institutions aren't willing. Um, some in institutions are facing issues that are too large and complex for them to solve on their own. And we talk a lot about then sharing sector best practice, but I couldn't put it better than Anna Bull from the 1752 group put it in Wonky this morning, which is that our sector best practice is really not very good. Um, and there are a lot of kind of what is being called wicked problems in the sector that institutions really struggle to grapple with that we need kind of regulatory clarity on. So those are things like um, data sharing, sharing outcomes, um, sharing information about like the identity of perpetrators. What do you do in fieldwork, for example, if it's not an affiliated fieldwork um, site? What do you do if it's between two students but it's not on campus and um, what do you do if it's between two students but they're from different universities in the same city um, these are all issues that we need greater kind of clarity and, and, a, and a, a kind of an agreed standard on um, and I completely agree with the point that currently kind of no one is happy and no one is satisfied from a disciplinary process and I think I would also include the, the staff members that work in them often as well um, often feel powerless, um, often feel like they wish they could do more or, uh, or often feel frustrated at the kind of system that they're having to work within whilst trying to genuinely help students in the way they can. So yeah, I do think um, it's been long overdue. Uh, I think it was um, welcomed in some ways, but um, I do hope that we'll see more progress um, on this from the OFS. 
quickly. Um, I think, again, I was, like everyone else, slightly disappointed they didn't go far enough. Um, there was no mention of staff-student uh, misconduct, which is um, horrendous um, and uh, really needs to be dealt with, um, especially given the, um, the Roman perpetrator issue that we have um, in academia. Um, I think a lot of this look, uh, whenever we talk about access to justice, especially like gender justice, it always looks as like a nice thing to do. People with morals, right? This is a good thing we should do to stop getting people, like letting people um, be assaulted. But actually like there is deep pedagogical reasoning that we should be protecting students from this kind of psychological damage when they're trying to complete their studies. Like I, the fact that I even have to say that is very silly. Um, and it's, you know, this is what the Office of Students is about. We had Michelle Donnellan, what, last year? or did you, I can't remember how many education secretaries ago she was, but saying, you know, it's about getting in and it's about getting on. You're not going to get on if you're being, like, exposed to sexual misconduct on a regular basis. It's not going to happen. And I do have some, like, tiny uh, sympathy for senior leadership teams in universities. And that's that, you know, a lot of them were at university themselves in like the 1960s and the 1970s when the student movements were all focused on removing penalization from education. So they didn't want um, misconduct panels. They didn't want uh, rules around drug possession. They didn't want the university to be uh, punishing students. And that was what all the sort of like movements around were around. So they've sort of come from an educational setting where they're now looking at students having sit-ins on campus and demanding that they they take sexual misconduct seriously and they're not, they're not really understanding it or you know large parts of the academic community saying we need more regulation and there's a sort of like I don't really <laughs> understand this but that's exactly why we need a regulator to step in because if we leave it up to individual senior leadership teams we leave it up to their definition of what is and isn't acceptable when it comes to behavior on campus what is and isn't a, ri a rigorous and appropriate investigation what is and isn't an acceptable outcome um, and that basically goes back to a point that I've been making all day, which is that there is no nationwide universal access to justice for our students who face this kind of violence. It is potluck on what institutions they go to. I, as a, you know, as a, as a graduate, I wish I'd gone to Durham. Like, I wish I'd been at Durham and I had this sort of amazing team, but I didn't go to Durham and we didn't have access to this kind of justice. How are universities turning around and saying that they're sending their graduates on an equal footing into the graduate workplace when other universities are sending less traumatized <laughs> graduates out. So yeah, when it comes down to uh, retaining, retaining students, uh, students' attainment, graduate outcomes, like all of this is deeply pedagogical. Even if we put aside the fact that this is an ethical and moral issue, and we're just looking at it in terms of outcomes alone, there is no reason why regulators shouldn't be stepping in here. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that is the end of the panel and the end of the annual Knowledge Forum this year. Um, so thank you everyone so much for coming along. I hope there's been a lot for you to take away and a lot to engage with. Um, and Culture Shift are looking forward to picking up conversations with you around what to do next and how to remove some of these barriers as well. Um, there is a drinks reception now. Is it in the cafeteria? Yeah, just um, Kenya's going to say a few things okay. to wrap us up. Um, but round of applause for our panel and thank you all. Amazing, thanks Pim. Um, yeah, so that panel was incredible. My mind's still kind of reeling from all of the things that we've just taken in. Um, we've got a few things to kind of just go over before we close the day. Um, I made a list because I thought I'd remember it, but now I'm just thinking about everything, yeah. Um, so first and foremost, you have your lanyard still. You can hand these in at the end. Uh, we will recycle the card rather than you having to throw them away. Um, but before you do that, on the back or alternatively on your tables, there are feedback forms. So if you scan the QR code, you can fill it in digitally or you can fill out on your table. Um, we really appreciate the feedback. It really helps us to know what you took away from the day, how we can make next year's event uh, even bigger, better, and more insightful for all of you. Um, 
There's a webinar happening next week, which I believe some of you were invited to sign up to this morning. It's looking at addressing staff to, se staff to student sexual misconduct. We have Sarah Bevan from UUK um, speaking on that panel as well, so it should be an incredible session. So please do try and attend if you can next Wednesday from 12 till 1. Um, we love the fact that today we've gotten you all together for you to share your stories. I've sat in and overheard many conversations where you've spoken about the challenges that you're facing, but also shared solutions in bringing those together. We love to amplify those, and one of the ways we do that is by building case studies. I know we've captured a few of you today, which has been incredible, but if you would be open to sharing your stories as a case study with us, then please again use the QR code, scan on there, and there's an interest form. Um, we'll be in touch. There's not much information to put on there at this moment. Um, we're incredibly excited tomorrow to have more of you uh, from our um, community of gold package partners at our community of practice event. That should be incredible. If you have any questions about that, please ask um, Vicky or somebody on the team, um, preferably Vicky because I think he has the most information. Um, and as Vim mentioned, we do have a drinks reception. So if you do have time to stick around, it would be great to chat with some of you uh, a little bit less. Uh, a bit more informally. Um, and then I think finally, it's just to say a huge thank you. First, you, firstly, to the staff here at the uh, Manchester Piccadilly Hotel. They've changed their name, so I don't know if that's right. The Manchester Piccadilly Hotel. To the Culture Shift team for all of the help that you guys have um, helped with today. Um, and then to all of you for attending and being engaged in the conversations. And then finally, to our speakers who have contributed so much useful and interesting knowledge, thoughts, comments. Um, I think there's so much that I was kind of taking note of and live tweeting throughout the day, but I think we started the conversation saying, you know, there's so much that we need to do and we all need to take a bite of the elephant. Um, and then finishing it with saying, as institutions and as, as individuals, we need to take those brave and bold steps, uh, not just so that we can help students in their individual issues, but that we can continue to move the sector forward and then amplify that across different sectors. So I hope everybody can take that forward into your roles and your jobs, into the week and into next year. And then hopefully next year we'll come together again and share how we've progressed over 365 days. So thank you everyone and safe journeys home. And we hope to speak to you all see, see, see you all soon. Thanks.